What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Friday. I'm Andrea Renee, joined by Miss Christine Steimer. Hello. And Miss Brittany Brombacher. Hello. Ladies, what an exciting day. We got to see the PlayStation 5 finally and talk about The Last of Us Part 2. That's what I've been doing all day. It's a Sony <laughs> pony kind of day. Sony it pony. It's definitely a Sony pony. I think that's like one of the more endearing fanboy, fangirl names you can give somebody. Because like, why is that bad? Like a Sony pony. Like ponies are great. Ponies are great. They're majestic creatures, you know? They're a little mean, but just, so am I. <laughs> Adorably mean. Sony Pony. Uh, we're going to talk about PlayStation in just a few minutes. Hopefully you guys were joining us live at twitch.tv slash what's good games. We had a fun little watch along. Thank you to everybody who showed up in the chat and got to see Brittany grunt her face <laughs> off to Resident <laughs> Evil. Oh boy. <laughs> we will have a deep dive into that as part of our continuing coverage of the PlayStation reveal event. But before we get to that, we have a couple of announcements so we had mentioned to you guys a little while back that Brittany and I are guesting with the folks from Good Morning From Hell over on Rooster Teeth. And that episode is going live on Monday. We'll talk about it again on the Monday show. But just as a little reminder to go check that out. We'll, of course, put those links up on the social media sites. And we're teaming up with GameSpot for their summer charity stream on Tuesday, June 30th from 12 p.m. to 2 p.m. Pacific time. So mark your calendars. We hope that you join us over there. Again, if you want to keep in touch with everything we're doing, what's good underscore games on Twitter is the best way to get all of those links. And you may notice that I am wearing one of our new Pride shirts. So of it's course, so pretty. Thank you. June is Pride Month, and we are excited to be teaming up once again with GLAAD, the Game Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation, to donate 100% of the profits for our Pride merch to a great cause that's helping further the voice of the LGBTQ plus community in the world of video games. And you can find all of that information and all of the merch at whatsgoodgames.com slash store. Thank you to this month's Patreon producers, Chewie's Godson, Alex Rogopoulos, Ferris Ate, Mohammed Mohammed, Marcus Brown, Punctified, and Malay Bittner. And welcome to our Patreon community, Khan, Blue Bay, Joe Wilson, David Rackley, Bustown Brian, Sophia Allen, Sean Blake, Oni Omogrigi, Omogrigi, uh, Andy T, Anthony Goody, and Andrew. And Brittany, we have a few new podcast reviewers. We do. We have Relaxative. <laughs> I get it. Big Willie Style 84. Me 1231205. Gorgeous Planet Sl Sly Clone. And Bizerk 2003. We did get, ladies, one one star review. But. <gasps> But I didn't feel like I wanted to read it. I didn't want to bring any negativity to light this week. But so with that said, if you haven't left us a review on iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it. It really helps us out. You it know, helps positive. us break out into those top 200 charts that we recently got into. Yeah. Hey. Thanks, friends. We appreciate the support. As we say every week, we know that financially supporting the show is not within everybody's means we love that you are just here listening enjoying the content but if you have a few moments that you can send our way a five-star review on your platform of choice would be much appreciated all right so we have a lot of news to dive into it's going to be a hefty show today so let's go ahead and get into it and this week the news is brought to you by honey we shop online a lot, especially now that we're all stuck at home. But did you know that you can make online shopping even better? As if online shopping could get better. It's pretty great as it is. But Honey makes it better, everybody, because Honey is the free online shopping tool that saves you money online. Honey automatically finds the best promo codes and applies them to your cart, which makes online shopping finally feel as easy as it's supposed to be. So here's how it works, everybody. You're shopping on your favorite sites, whether it be Target, Sephora, Macy's, Etsy, Lululemon, DoorDash, you name it. And when you check out, a little box pops down and says, apply coupons. You click the button, you let it run through all the codes it can find on the internet, and boom, you save money. It's literally that easy. It only takes a few seconds and you can just watch the prices drop. 
So I have been talking a lot about how much money I've saved with Honey and how much I love their Honey Gold program. I once again was ordering some items. I got new backing cards for those Defenders of Video Game City pins that I'm about to ship out. And I used Honey at Vistaprint.com where I printed those cards and boom, I saved $11 just like that. Didn't even have to do anything. It's great. I love Honey. And if you guys want to love Honey and save money as well, we have got a special deal for you. Uh, you can go to honey.com slash what's good. Excuse me, that's joinhoney.com slash what's good. Because Honey has found it's over 17 million members, over $2 billion in savings. And they have... 30,000 different stores that they support online and they're adding more every day. Plus, they've got over 100,000 five-star reviews. Brittany, don't think that we've forgotten about the somersaults. We have I know. I know. I have to make up for my somersaults. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. We will hold you to it some other time. But for now... If you want to get in on the honey movement and save money while shopping online, you got to go to joinhoney.com slash what's good. It's free to use and installs in just seconds and not using honey is literally passing up free money. Plus now it's part of the PayPal family. We like PayPal. We use PayPal all the time. Get honey for free at joinhoney.com slash what's good. That's joinhoney.com slash what's good. And this week's segment is also brought to you by Miro. Working remotely doesn't mean that you need to feel disconnected from your team. With Miro, you can get your work done together and collaborate wherever you are. Telecommuting, remote working, distributed teams, call it whatever you like. We're all doing it these days. But more and more teams now work from home because the pandemic is preventing us from seeing each other in person. <gasps> Collaborate better and get work done faster with the help of Miro. If you're still using an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper to brainstorm or organize your work, well, you might want to consider expanding your horizons. Miro lets you visualize everything you're working on all in one place. It's an online whiteboard that brings teams together anytime, anywhere across time zones. Their infinite canvas is perfect for brainstorming, making mock-ups, organizing files, and managing complex projects. They even have templates to help you get started quickly. I know that once I show this to Rihanna, she is going to go <laughs> crazy for it. You can add your docs, your spreadsheets, your sticky notes, and other important information directly to Miro so you can always have a single real-time collaboration hub. And Miro can integrate with the programs that you're already using, like Google Drive, Dropbox, Jira, Slack, and more. Oh my gosh, do I have some Jira horror stories to tell you guys sometime. You can even video chat with coworkers without ever leaving Miro. Over 5 million users worldwide trust Miro to help their teams work more efficiently. And it's everything you need to start working better together. Start collaborating for free when you sign up for an account at Miro.com slash what's good. That's M-I-R-O dot com slash what's good to sign up for a free account with unlimited team members. Miro.com slash what's good. Start collaborating for free today. All right, ladies. <sighs> yeah. What would you like to do here? Should we just kind of run down the order that the announcements happened in the showcase today? That works for me. Sure, yeah. That makes the most sense. Some things are not as exciting as others, but... That is I true. I mean, we could talk overall our quick for, like impressions of the thing. Sure. So PlayStation had been hyping this event up. We know that they'd been running commercials for it. And so I think we all anticipated an E3 style show. And I think we got it. Oh, for sure. This was great. Oh, yeah. I was... Yeah, I was... This is the only show so far that we've seen from any developer, any console maker, anybody... Um, that actually felt like E3 to me, which was really nice because as much as I like complain about E3, I don't really complain too much, but like sometimes like it's hot or whatever. I'm an old and crotchety. It's but, hot. Uh, you know, the, the conferences are the best part for me and I love getting the hype out of them. And I definitely felt that today. Um, so that was really fun and exciting for me. Yeah. Brittany, what'd you think? Oh yeah. It was, I mean, I'm still emotionally exhausted after <laughs> Resident Evil 8. So Resident Evil, Resident Evil 8, I think, was like the third to last reveal. And so the whole time I had been hope, like anticipating, is it going to come? Is it going to come? That's what she said. And my heart <laughs> was like beating so fast that whole fucking stream that by the time it came, <laughs> oh, I, <dear. laughs> I screamed. It was fantastic. And then Horizon Zero Dawn came after that. And now I'm still, I feel like I could just fall asleep right now. I mean, it was <laughs> exciting. And I feel like a lot of the games that we saw... And not to mention, we got actual gameplay, which was fantastic. Yeah, I think every yeah. 
everything shown had gameplay question mark or at least most at least at least well, it depends like quarters. how do you classify gameplay gameplay it's like does that have, to have a hud on it can it just no be like i don't think it needs it just needs to look like you can be moving the stick around like i feel like it's fairly easy to tell if something is a cutscene versus yeah there were a couple cinematic moments particularly for some of the new ips or the smaller games but yeah. we saw a lot of That's gameplay true. which yeah. was great and what I like about the way that PlayStation handled their presentation was that they didn't set up expectations for what we were going to see. And I think that that's smart. And PlayStation has been running their E3 style conferences now for the last like four or five years really well. And they feel like they're edited really well together. It doesn't feel like there's a lot of fluff in the middle or that they labor too long on one particular game, which can sometimes be you know, a downfall of some yeah, of the other matter. conferences. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah. And it's tough because like I have had the privilege of working with teams on these style of events, obviously hosted EA play specifically, but also worked on some smaller style events as well. And I know just how hard it is for those teams to manage all of the different voices across these publishers who are like, my game is important. I want the most of amount of minutes I can get for my game. And it's yeah. a balance, right? And it's a really tough balance. And so I think that they really knocked it out of the park. And I'm really glad that we finally got to see the box. I know, dude. We weren't sure for a while there. We thought we were just going to get the sacred symbols over and over and over again. But there <laughs> yes, it was. But no, after the symbols came the box. <laughs> there it came. I don't know why, though. I mean, I like the box, but why didn't they show any quick shots of it laying horizontally? So they you know, that did. just would have saved. So they did, but you had blink and you miss it. That's how, oh. how fast it was. Um, I think my friend, I tweeted my friend Ray Carcillo, friend of the show. Um, he said, let's see. His exact tweet from Ray Carcillo was, yes, it lays down. They could have held this shot for more than 20 frames and saved themselves a headache. So Dang. 20 frames I mean, I had is like whiskey. a blink of an eye. Yeah. So I obviously <laughs> tweeted or after the event, and I was like, I think it's interesting that these, like, this is apparently the time for vertical consoles. And everyone's like, it lays horizontally. I'm like, yes, I know it can lay horizontally, just like the Xbox can theoretically lay horizontally. But I found it interesting that both manufacturers chose to primarily show the boxes vertically. I'm like, that was a style choice for both of them, which it's means that when they designed it, they both thought that that was the way it would go in your living room, right? Like, if you, if you are presenting a marketing image to the consumer, that's how you want them to then take that thing and use it. So, I, yeah, no, I thought, it, building off of that, I saw some chatter online about how that style of marketing is mimicking the way that people think about their PC tower. Now, if you think about the last generation for both PlayStation and Xbox, both of them at the beginning of the generation when they were unveiling their systems put a giant emphasis on media and having to be a system that you can watch Apps, living room right like you can yeah. watch your netflix on you can watch your youtube you can put your dvds in right like that was like a thing that was a big uh emphasis particularly for xbox at the beginning of the last generation and now we're moving away from that and going back towards just raw hardware performance and game performance focusing more on the games because they know that people are watching media across a variety of devices today with all of the smart devices that exist in people's homes and i think it's an interesting idea how they've kind of transitioned the market Marketing potentially to appeal to people that might look at it as a substitute for buying a new PC. Yeah, I think of the two of them, as we've we've discussed a little bit offline, was like the Xbox just looks straight up like it could just be a PC tower. Like it's just kind of boring. It is very minimalistic. Whereas the PlayStation people made fun of that it looks like a router. It looks like X insert X <laughs> random hardware thing here. And sure, but at least it does have stylistic choice to it, whereas the Xbox just felt a little bit more like if you were, if you weren't sure, you could mistake it for a mini PC or a mini fridge. I saw that meme <laughs> going around. <laughs> or, <laughs> or a really fridge. mini fridge. That's Somebody just... mocked up the Xbox logos on this little black fridge that looks almost identical. To it's the a skincare Xbox. fridge. That's <laughs> where Xbox needs to go into some masks for gamers. Let's go. <laughs> I thought it was funny. So this is clearly very polarizing, the design of this box. I love it. I think it's awesome. I love that it's got personality. I like that it's got curves and little wings. And I like the the white and the black together with like the little blue accent. I am all for this. But I absolutely understand why some people would go, ew, gross, I don't want. 
But here, I think that's interesting, though, because I think that that means that they did a good job. If you have if you react to it at all, positive or negative, the designer did their job. Whereas I mean, I, I don't like, want anyone to look at me like you gross. Yeah, but like, <laughs> but it, like when you think about the Xbox, I feel like the worst. You're just like, it's there. There's not a whole lot to critique about it because it is literally just a black box. Yes, and yeah. that's not, I'm not I mean, trying I'm, to talk shit about Xbox. I'm just saying like the difference between them I find interesting. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I'm a simple woman. I think it's a cool design. I don't have a console like it or anything. It looks like it as long as it plays the games. I really don't give two shits what it looks like, but it's different. It's like yeah. Jetsons like, and I like the controller too. Yeah, I'm just Ooh, like, it's, a, it's attractive like. package. It is Jetsons like, I like that. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And we know that this is just the day one edition. There will be many, many different colors of these consoles down the line, and there'll be weird j- rejiggerings of everything. Later, you know, in a couple of years from now. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. But I like that it feels like it has potential to have really cool custom designs. Whereas with the Xbox series X, it's literally just going to be like a wrapper skin around the outside of the box. And so there's really not so much. <laughs> but it you could can be do. cool if they had it. I mean, I don't know how they built it inside. So maybe it wouldn't look cool, but if they have any that are semi translucent, similar to what they did with the gears of war Xbox, but like they have a little bit of parts that you can kind of see through, but then not, they could do some cool skins on that, but yes, it is always going to be just like a rectangle. Yeah. Uh, what do we think about Sony coming out guns blazing with the all digital edition? I mean, I'm fine with it, but they didn't announce prices. So I feel like that. I feel like that's a Gamescom PR beat, but right? I, mean, I just felt like it, it mm. took a little bit of the wind out of the sails. Cause you're like, Oh, there's two, but like what, what's, what's the difference going to be? And also what is the skew exactly? Like all I know is it just doesn't have a drive. Yeah. So we don't have yeah. a lot of the tech specs. I don't think I'll do another. I'm pass looking right now, and you know, it, all it says is like it doesn't have a disk drive. Yeah, there's just like no of course disk not. drive. So it's just it's yeah, PS5, and then there's PS5 digital. It's, it's just missing digital. a little bit of that curve on the side where the disk drive is. is. Yeah, we get, the, we get the skinny Skinner. and the fat, the fat edition. I mean, yeah. you know, it's not. <laughs> it's not quite. I mean, it's not quite the PS3 fatty days of old. Oh my, those that was a big boy. Oh, that's a big chunker right there. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's not super surprising to see this. I know there had been some discussion. Some people were adamant that Sony would not go discless. And that I was kind of, well, whatever. It's sign of the times. It, it makes sense to me. And as we were chatting on stream, I'm kind of contemplating getting the digital edition because I can't remember the last time I put a disc inside any of my consoles. I think it was when, like Steimer was saying, when we got our review copies of the Xbox One X, right? Yeah. And it came with a 4K earth dvd yeah, blu-ray and i was like oh yeah. i'm gonna try this out and that yeah. was it and in fact that yeah I, had, I don't think i've taken it out since then yeah it might still be in there <laughs> yeah well i i have made the running joke on the show that my rainbow six siege disc has has been primarily the thing that is in my disc drive as well but i recently watched the lord of the rings extended edition blu-ray and i have a several blu-rays including 4k blu-rays and so i was glad to see that sony is bringing the 4k blu-ray player back in for PS5 because that was notoriously missing from PS4. Could play Blu-rays, but not 4K ones. That was an Xbox um, big win when it came to the disk drive there. I think that it's too early to get rid of the disk drive. I think oh, that, totally. yeah. Blu- that Blu-ray player means a lot to people. It means a lot to other people for yeah. sure. For me, it's it's time. But yeah, I can definitely see how some people have not quite you know, jumped on board that chip yet. And I don't blame them at all. Yeah. But I think it's smart of them to offer this as a SKU to get in there at a cheaper price point. They can definitely shave a substantial amount of money off the MSRP. I think we all have concerns about, but how big is the internal storage? Obviously there are plenty of external storage options you can get, but knowing how expensive it is to just get into the ecosystem, I always don't like to see them kind of cheap out on internal storage. I would like them to have at least two terabytes but i'm guessing one terabyte is going to be the standard and i hope not let's say for most gamers who are playing maybe a handful of games a year like two or three games a year that's probably fine they probably don't need that but i have to constantly delete things from my primary ps4 because we installed an ssd on a different ps4 that's no longer the right one and with moving back and forth in the studio is just not realistic and i know that my situation is very unique unique is the word yes um and very like few people have to have to worry about that as an issue but i think we all are worried about the ever creeping file size of these games i mean there's a lot of games that are over 100 gigabytes like without breaking a sweat that's a lot 
Yeah. yeah. And like I was saying earlier, if you have games as a service, you have to constantly, you know, you, you keep those downloaded on your system. So if a big whopper updates. does come along, mm-hmm. like 100 plus gig, big boy Final Fantasy 7, I mean, there you go. That's mm-hmm. like 20% of your one terabyte hard space right there. Look at me doing math. Oh, oh my God. Look yeah. at you. That was ah, sexy. Ah, I, liked it. I love it. Thanks. So I am excited to see more and to hear more. I definitely think that it's going to be competitively priced, but we'll obviously not find out more about that until later in the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about some games, unless you have any other thoughts about the hardware you would like to discuss. No, I think the, no. Think the design co- choices are cool. I like the controller look of it. Although it does, like it reminds me of a boomerang, which I think is fun. Um <laughs> <laughs> and I think, yeah. And then they just fucking killed it with a lot of the games, which we'll now discuss. Yeah. Didn't yeah. quite open on a strong note. I'll give it that. Yeah. Grand Theft Auto. The opening of Rockstar and then you're like, baited. All right. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> it's just Grand Theft Auto again. Well, we knew that we weren't going to see anything from I GTA 6 know, yet. But still, I'm like, why are you even? Okay, fine. And they'll give you like a million dollars from now until the thing launches. And you're like. Is that a lot? And then someone in the chat was like, no, the cars cost. Oh, the GTA on the cash. Rocks- yeah. What's that other Rockstar game that people are always asking for? Bully? Bully. Is that? Yeah. I was like, yeah. maybe we're going to get a bully. But no. No. I, but, no I mean, that wasn't a surprise. It's like, oh, everyone on PS5 gets Grand Theft Auto Five. Well, of course, because that's going to make you so much fucking money, man. Yeah. it's That was kind of an <laughs> LOL moment. In my mind, PlayStation clearly had a marketing handshake deal or on on paper deal would be actually probably what yeah, it was. Like, there's definitely uh, they had a deal involved. together <laughs> to make to do some kind of big announcement. And then when E3 and the whole idea of state of play around E3, you know, got shifted, I'm sure they were trying to figure out, well, what can we do? What can we say? And maybe they have something else happening later in the world of Rockstar, but I think them saying, "Oh, we're going to bring GTA online for free." in 2021 to ps5 is like not a newsworthy announcement it's like you should do that you shouldn't charge people to play your game you should let them bring gta 5 to the new consoles for free because you know you're making money from the in-game currency <laughs> anyway like so yeah. much money like i'm not gonna give you a pat on the back rockstar for doing the thing that you should do but cool <laughs> I, don't know. I was really hoping they would also confirm that they would be bringing red dead redemption to mm-hmm. online Red Dead Online to PS5. I don't know mm. why that wasn't like a dual announcement. It feels like that's that's, that's a tee up rut row. So yeah, nice. probably something to do with the popularity of that game. Obviously, but I, I haven't heard anything about that in a while. I wonder how it's yeah, doing. I haven't either they did a huh? big update uh, in May was the last time I remember hearing about it. But as far as I'm aware, Rockstar's still supporting it, and they have lots of post-launch plans for it. And even though it's l- clearly not as robust as GTA, never has been and never will be, it's still worth supporting, I imagine, that there's still people paying money for things and Rockstar's still profiting and it's still supporting. Anywho, that was kind of like a little whimper at the beginning, but they, they then- came roaring back in with... Spider-Man. Yes. So this is called... Is it Spider-Man Miles Morales? Like, is that is that actually the title of the game? Um, the yes. S- Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales. That is a mouthful. Say that five times, oh. Ben. <laughs> Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales. <laughs> Marvel <laughs> Spider-Man Miles <laughs> Morales. Well, you got like two and a half times. That was <laughs> pretty good. <laughs> so this is a PS4 exclusive, of course, since Spider- Spider-Man was a PS4 exclusive. I also like Spider-Man who just eats Spider-Man. I like Spider-Man too. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Eats all the pie just like a kid. <laughs> Straight out of the can. So j- to be clear, I didn't mean that tip, but- Marvel Spider-Man Miles Morales was a PS4 exclusive. Obviously, it's not. It's a PS5 yes. game. But yes. it is, of course, the sequel exclusive. to ps4's exclusive and its release date is set for holiday 2020 which i think is incredibly exciting so this is going to definitely be the launch game for ps5 that is going to drive hardware sales yeah i'm stoked because i always thought miles has like he's kind of cooler powers honestly than og mm-hmm. peter parker um so wait yes okay god my brain was like is that correct yes that's correct that's his name <laughs> I had a, had a it's moment. been a day everybody so it's, been a, it's, it's yeah. been a very long day of talking so sometimes you're like am i still here do i exist okay um, i have a question yeah. since you know more about this than i do uh-huh. so i hopped into spider-man ps4 not really being a big spider-man fan loved sure. the game thought it was great what should i be excited about 
about Miles Morales with the Spider-Man game? I mean, I, I know, think, obviously, you know nothing about the game, but, like, what is he like as a character? I don't know, obviously, much about the, the game or the story or what they're going to tell with this with Miles. Um, but even just based on some of the... Like, did you not watch Into the Spider-Verse? Eh. Oh, Brittany. <gasps> oh, it's so I know. good. So Miles just has a slightly more interesting background. Um, but then he... His powers, like, he has electricity, um, and he can go invisible. So, like, he has a little... He has, like, the original powers, and then he also has um, a couple of extra goodies because he was bitten by a different spider from, like, the same lab as huh? theoretically what kind of what you're going for there. Um, but... And also, like, his suits tend to be a lot more fun and vibrant. Um, the logo, at least, again, from, like, the movie, like, was him, like, spray painting it on, and so it just has a little bit more of a... Um, less polished look, which I really liked. Um, so I'm curious to see a lot of the costumes. Like they could have a lot of fun with the suits in this one. Again, I've already mentioned his powers are a little different than your average average Spider Man. Um, so they can have a lot of fun playing with those as well. Especially if we get the puddles like we wanted. Can you now electrocute people <laughs> oh, with your God. hands? I forgot about Puddle Gate. Yes, yes. Puddle Gate. <laughs> I highly recommend, Brittany, that you carve some time out this weekend to watch Into the Spider-Verse. It's so it good. It is such an amazing movie. It won a bunch of awards for animation and writing and voice acting. And it's arguably the best Spider-Man movie? Question mark? And the music is incredible. Yeah. The like, soundtrack I, I listen to on repeat all the time. It's great. Yes. I, so you, you would actually, I think, enjoy the movie. So you should okay. watch it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then you can get hype for for yeah, this Yeah, then game. you can get hype for Miles Morales. But I love, I love that Insomniac can put more resources towards this now that they are a Sony first-party studio and that I think that this game is going to crush it if the PS4 Spider-Man game is any indication about how it's going to go. So out the gate, they've got an amazing exclusive that they have in the holiday launch window. So that's exciting. Yeah. And then continuing on, we have got another Insomniac title. Um, oh, yeah. Ratchet and Clank Rift oh, yeah. Apart was announced. So the gameplay for this looked great. They showed a healthy chunk of gameplay mm -hmm. for the brand new entry into the Ratchet and Clank series. So over at IGN that they write that they showed what appeared to be gameplay of the heroes jumping through portals to other dimensions before being split apart. Insomnia Games said that players will be able to jump from planet to planet almost instantly and are also implementing ray trace reflection on Clank's head. Oh, a little Clank. Oh, 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 ray sold. tracing for Clank. Yeah. There was also, obviously, they... they uh, I don't know why it doesn't mention it there, but they teased like another. I don't actually. What is he? What the is character? his species? What is Ratchet's species? A cat. But I have basically, no idea. like an alternate dimension. I thought it was meant know. to be an alternate dimension version of Ratchet. I don't entirely know if that's what it is, but that's what it seemed like it was hinting at. Um, but mm. I called it Snow Fox Ratchet because the character is like a, a little bit more gray, um, whitish grayish. Lighter color. A Lombax. It's a fictional species from the Ratchet and Clank video game series. There you go. We found another one of those. Anthrom basically. Anthropomorphic. Anthropomorphic cat. Yes. That's so there was another of that in this trailer. Don't exactly know what it means, but it's there. Yes. So Insomniac yeah. coming out strong at the top of the show. And now I don't have the exact order that we watch them in because these recaps that I'm looking at um, are kind of going out of order but I, I think feel like after that was Gran Turismo uh, gr yeah from Polyphony so mm -hmm. that might have been the next one so let's talk about GT so Gran Turismo was part of our prediction that we would see and I think all of us were like ooh shiny cars shiny cars but clearly as you guys are That's aware about the extent of it you know yeah. that we're not simulation racing players here at aficionados Games. aficionados that's to say the <laughs> least so we don't really have too much to say about it but no release date was given for when we're going to see gt7 and knowing how they take has, a while has had delays several delays i remember vividly doing so many stories about gt5 being delayed so did i i mean oh, I was, I went, that was my t my only tgs and i did like a, a show a show i did a video on the show floor um, for IGN, and one of the things was like, oh, it's finally, it's whatever. It was a joke about it being delayed for like a million years. Yep. 
things get delayed. It's the way the cookie crumbles. And cookies. Um, I'm <laughs> going to pull up actually our eight ball um, prediction so we can check those at the end of all of this. Uh, Britt, you want to take the next announcement? Yeah. Is it the, are we, make sure we're, <laughs> Project Athea? Is that the one we're all looking at here? Athea? Sure. All right. Okay, cool. So this is interesting. So this was, or is, Luminous Productions next game, Square Enix, obviously. So the thing with Luminous Productions is Hajime Tabata was working and a whole bunch of people on Final Fantasy 15, all that DLC that got scrapped. I think it was like 2018-ish. Tabata left Luminous Productions and then all that Final Fantasy stuff was scrapped and we didn't know what they had been working on since then. Turns out it's this Project Athea game and it looks real pretty. I don't really know too much about it, but I'm going to read this little like blurb here if I can find it. And interesting fact, Gary Witta, I think, is the, he led the writing team on this. Yeah, he did, yes, he announced that. Said, yeah. yeah, also my website has frozen, so oh, I'm unable beautiful. to read anything. It did look very oh, here we go. Here we oh, go. There you go. got it? I was trying to write, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the, so it's not much is known about the game as only a very short glimpse was shown, but it featured a robed woman leaping around the wilderness and even controlling the wildlife. She takes on many different monsters from wolf-like creatures to floating tentacle-bearing eyeball beasts, all while being surrounded by beautiful scenery. It's a little hard to get an impression of what the plot is, but the visuals are so astounding, it almost doesn't matter, and no release date at this point. Yeah, this was an, when this popped up, I was really curious about it. I mean, obviously because of the stupid reason that there's a cape, but um, just because I visually felt it looked very interesting and different than a lot of the stuff you see. I actually felt that way about most of the games during the showcase. I liked that they all felt very distinct um, and that you could kind of walk away from this feeling like no matter what kind of gamer you are, there was something in there that could excite you uh, ranging from, well, obviously we'll talk about all these, but like, if you are like the hardcore racing guy and you're really excited about Gran Turismo, great. They showed you some of that. If you're more of like a family person and you want something for your kids, there was like a little big planet thing. Although it's not called that, uh, B- uh sack boy adventures or something. A big adventure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they have really interesting sort of tickets Cat like games, this. Like stray. <laughs> yeah. There, there was a whole variety of stuff here, which I thought was really interesting. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about stray, which is really cute. This was teased, and at first I was like, if this is a game where you get to play as a freaking cat, because it opens up, right, and you're kind of in this futuristic neon-lit city, and there's all the people are robots. It's, like they so, have... yeah, it's just, there's a bunch of robots, and then you just see on the back wall, it says R.I.P. humans, and that's how you get the understanding that there are no but humans sh- left. Shit hit the fan. So according to Polygon, Stray is a beautiful new game headed to PS5. It puts players in the role of a clever cat lost in a world where humanity has been wiped away, leaving nothing but robots behind. Developed by Blue 12, the game began as a two-person effort called HK Project in 2015 and being published by Annapurna. It's a third-person cat adventure game set amidst the detailed neon-lit alleys of a decaying cyber city in the murky environments of a seedy underbelly. Players will play as a stray cat, roaming surroundings high and low, defending against unforeseen threats and solve the mysteries of this unwelcoming place inhabited by nothing but unassuming droids and dangerous creatures. I mean, into it. Can you get into much it than that? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, either. when we were watching, I'm I was down. like, "Wait, can you play as the cat? Are you playing the cat? You're probably not playing the cat. Oh my god, you're playing the cat. It was just like <laughs> I know. I was like, "Oh my god, it was a roller coaster. It was good. And then he has a little cute neon, well, not neon, little backpack on him. Yeah, I was like, "Oh my god, he has a little messenger bag. How adorable is this? Yeah, something new. That's really cute. There was some more adorable." What was the ah uh, the other game with the little girl, the girl who had like the little black fuzzies running around behind her? Oh that yeah, that um, was Pragmata. No, no. Let's see. Returnal. No, you sure? Yeah, it was. A, it had a key. It was like Kina or something. This with a K. Oh yeah, oh Kina. yeah, Kina, it Kina was... Bridge of Spirits. Yes, there Kina Bridge of Spirits looks. So adorable, but also just cool Um, because you play as this younger woman and you have like a posse of spirits or something unclear Um, called the rot, a team of tiny spirit panions called the rot. Kina must enhance their abilities, find new ways to allow them to manipulate the environment. Kina is a story driven action adventure game that tax players as finding a growing team of tiny spirits. Yeah. Yeah, apparently they're called the rat, but don't let the name oh, well. fool you. They are adorable. They're real cute. Um, and this game looks really interesting to me, too. I really dig the art style. 
Yeah. Someone in chat said it was Horizon Zero Dawn for children, which is great. We know nothing about it. That's probably not correct. But I did get some Horizon and Zelda vibes from it. Yeah. Into it. Yeah. I'm so into it. That, was one, of the, that one and Project Athea, I think, were the two of the more interesting unheard of games before this that I was really interested in. Then there was Returnal, which I thought was kind of interesting. It's the latest game from House Marky. The company that made a big splash with Resogun at the launch of PS4. It's a game that seems about a pilot who has to fight for survival, changing in some way every time she dies. Very groundhoggy with guns. Groundhog. There were two Ground groundhoggy hog. games with guns with during guns. the presentation. Yeah, so each time she dies, she resurrects, somehow change. Players will need to fight through this alien world, evolving as they go. It's a third-person shooter with sci-fi weapons and mysterious alien enemies. Yeah, Housemark's known for their shooters, usually... I always thought they were kind of more isometric, but um, I think it's interesting that they're hopping into third person. Um, and I'm curious to see what their storytelling will be like, because with Resogun, you obviously just, it was just like you're picking people up and shooting people around and like, there was a lot going on there. Um, but the trailer of this was intriguing just in the sense of the way that they structured it. I think the cinematic was very strong in that sense. Mm. It looks like they were working on a battle royale game called Storm Divers back in, oh, well, I don't know back when, but it looks like they had an unannounced partner at the time and they put it all on hold and now we know why. Makes sense. Yeah. That's well, cool. Well, they, I don't know if you guys remember a couple of years back when they made that uh, blog post talking about Arcade is Dead after they had some kind of lackluster arcade sale. Arcade shooters. That's what they're called. Yeah. I was like, the, the, word, the term was escaping me. So it's interesting to see that this art style is a real departure from some of the stuff that they have done previously, but I'm interested to see more. They typically make pretty cool games, but it still wasn't the thing that was the most exciting for me from this press conference. Um, but before we get to my most exciting, my most exciting thing. Do we thing, want to talk about the other loop game? Uh, sure. From one loop game to the next loop game? Uh, yeah. Death loop? Death loop. Yeah. We, let me pull up Bethesda's press release. So they sent me... A press release today. So when we saw these two games, we instantly remembered that they were from Bethesda's press conference at E3 last year. So we saw Deathloop and then we saw Ghostwire Tokyo, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, we actually saw Ghostwire first. So Deathloop, of course, is from Arcane, um, famously Arcane the Leon. creators of uh, Dishonored, the Dishonored franchise. And yes, Arcane has a couple of different teams. So but Arcane Leon is the studio behind the Dishonored franchise. So Deathloop, according to the press release, as cult players are trapped in a time loop on the enigmatic island of Black Reef, doomed to repaint the same day for eternity. The only chance to escape is to break the loop by assassinating eight key targets before the day resets. However, lurking in the shadows is rival assassin Juliana, equipped with her own equally powerful abilities and weapons on a mission to protect the loop by assassinating cult and restarting the cycle. Deathloop is launching holiday 2020, and according to the press release, both Deathloop and Ghostwire Tokyo will release exclusively for console on PlayStation 5, which is a Ooh, wowza. I that is a not wowzer. ready for that announcement. I just assumed that these would be coming to Xbox Series X in addition, and clearly that means they're coming to PC as well as PS5, but I, yeah, I, I'm kind of a little flabbergasted yeah. about that as a choice from Bethesda. Money. They're clearly money, they're like, money. We'll, we'll bet on that horse. Yeah. <laughs> Based on this past generation, I guess I don't blame them, but no. um, still a sad miss for Xbox for sure. Sure. Yeah. They need all the third party help. Well, especially for a game like Ghostwire Tokyo, which I know is highly anticipated from a lot of fans who are like yo i want to see what tango gameworks is doing next so uh speaking of ghostwire tokyo from shinji mikami and tango gameworks comes ghostwire tokyo a next gen action adventure game coming exclusively to playstation 5 and pc in 2021 in oh, the me, of tokyo beset by spirits and supernatural threats with an arsenal of powerful tech and elemental abilities at your command tango has taken the full advantage of the power of the ps5's next 
next-gen hardware to create immersive and mysterious worlds to explore. But what about the oh. ray tracing? Does it have ray tracing? I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure, sure it does. <laughs> ray tracing. But is there ray tracing on the character's head? Because that's the most important part. Uh, oh, this game okay, looks Brett, perfect lay it for on me. Us. Just, no, it just looks so perfect for me. There's creepy, bodiless... I don't know what they are, but they're wearing like school children outfits. There's Slender Man looking dude with umbrellas. There's creepy ass long hair shit. I don't know. All I know is there are evil spirits and it is set in Tokyo. And that is 100% my jam. And I'm very excited. So remember last year, Sam, I think you and I, because I think Andrea, you had to leave the Bethesda press conference because you weren't feeling well. But yes. Ikumi Nakamura is her name. Remember how oh, she just yeah. stole the hearts of everyone she was on the stage? Best, yes. Yeah, unfortunately, she's no longer at Tango, but oh, um, wow. she left. She, yeah, she left in September, I think, of last year. Someone uh, snapped her up. Someone said, "We will pay you more to be cute on our team instead." I know. I hope so. I don't know why she left. But anyway, yeah, I'm very she, excited for this. Art. What was she? What was her role? I forget. Do you remember? Cr dr creative director? creative director? No, I think I think Mikami is the creative director. I think. Hold on, let's look. Okay, da -da, here's an article. Former Tango Gameworks creative director, Ikumi oh, Nakamura. Yeah, oh, yeah go on with your badass self, girl. Anywho. Go, go make some other weird shit that Brittany will love because she, I mean, this is, yeah. I could not think of a game that is more you than this. I mean, there is one. Well, there is one and we'll get to it in a minute. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like for new IP, I mean. Oh, yeah, no, this is this is great. I mean, Tango, I know a lot of fan, people are fans of the Evil Within, Evil Within 2. So it's, yeah, it's they're going to be bummed out. I guess they can only get it on PS5. But, you know, you got to get a console for it. Yeah. I mean, that to me has been so far the first big third-party exclusive that we've heard for next gen, right? I don't think Xbox has announced, like, something that's exclusive for series x that's third party have they my memory is really bad well, uh, i feel like she nothing of this scale because i feel like we would be comparing it right about now yeah so i'll take a look in my notes and see if i can find something but let's continue on there's more games to discuss so one of the fun games that we all were really digging the art style of is called destruction all stars so this is a PvP destruction derby game from developer Lucid Games. Didn't really get too much details about it, but I was really loving the way that it looked, and I'm intrigued to see more. It was kind of a, it was like yeah, like a race, like you race in your cars around a track, sort of like a on a, like a Rocket League style field, but not um, because you're kind of derbying and crashing your cars, but you can also get out of the cars and just straight up kick people or like so punch them. So like there, it seemed, I'm like okay, this is wacky but interesting. Yeah. I mean, yeah, show me more. And the, yeah, the style of the characters, the the character design was really fun. And like, I was like, oh yeah, I want that jacket. <laughs> like, I want just let's. Can you make these clothes real? Thanks, bye. <laughs> yeah, I realize now that we're going out of order. And oh, I no, we've been out of order. <laughs> I apologize fine. to everybody. Oh yeah. Um, but I was excited to see Hitman Three from yeah. IO Interactive coming in January 2021 for PS5 and presumably other places. So this looks great. I was really happy with the reboot and what they did with hitman and how they brought it back to life and they you know experimented with episodes and then kind of walked that back and we don't really quite know how they're going to handle hitman 3 but hopefully they are going to do some cool stuff so yeah this one they didn't show a lot of this was more just cinematic yeah true oh it looks like you can carry your locations and their progress from hitman 2 into hitman 3 Ooh, that's exciting nice yeah yeah, players who own Hitman and Hitman 2 can play the entire series inside Hitman 3. Wow, oh. that's awesome. Good job, friends. More content to play on the new system. And then we saw another look at Godfall, which was revealed at the Game Awards last fall. So this was the like really the first big third-party game that we heard about for PlayStation 5 from Gearbox. So we got to see a little bit more about this melee action game, Godfall. I have to admit i'm still a little bit confused about what the gameplay is in this game it looks like you just talk smash but i don't know why necessarily <laughs> I mean, like i don't fair. like i'm just like are you do you just do you just run around and swing your sword i feel like you might just run around and swing your sword and there's nothing wrong with that but it is a little bit uh i don't know yeah, no, one dimensional, I, I suppose, it's so far. It's a three-player co-op action RPG. Ah, okay, yeah. So it's just hack smash. 
That's fine. I mean, that, it looks real pretty. Yeah. And I mean, I'm all about face tanking and smacking shit in medieval this settings. It's also a so. perfect Britney game because, yeah, she's, yeah, she's the one who's just like, I run Ooh. it, I smash sword, I good. Acqu- I good. Yeah, according to Gearbox, they are calling it a looter slasher melee action RPG. Oh, oh, she likes say that. No Those are all her keywords. Oh, oh. Oh yeah, if first of its kind. You forgot that party injury, the buzzword. Oh, if first oh, of its kind. Sorry. If first of its kind. <laughs> sure. We'll be the judge of that. Um, <laughs> continuing on, we've got what we mentioned earlier, Pragmata from Capcom. This was also creepy. Yeah, so this was a, one of those another one of those titles that I was kind of having trouble following what was going on. Um, it's so according to IGN, it's a mysterious new Capcom game. It offered little in the way of concrete evidence of what the game will be, but we saw an astronaut, a little girl, a shattering sky, and they fought a satellite and landed on the moon, question mark? And the little girl, to be clear, is not a little girl. She's a little robot. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can't yeah. take people into space. They explode. That's correct. They die. <laughs> it's, they this die is for a PC death. gamer. It's not the most enlightening trailer in the world, and little wonder the game isn't launching until 2022. So, yeah. Yeah, that was uh, one of the, lo- the farthest out we saw was 2022, and this is one of them. A breathtaking and immersive sci-fi setting like never before. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Dun. But yeah, like a satellite just crashes through. I was like, is this the Truman Show? Why is there a satellite? The way it fell through was interesting. And then then they like just floated up into space. And I was like, did I just drop peyote and not know it? Maybe. I don't know. (laughs) It's the only thing I can think of. What is that? I don't know. Something very loud is happening. It's like a garbage disposal. Maybe. I don't hear oh, anything. Oh, yeah. It's, no. It's probably that's, what it that's was. That's definitely louder than I anticipated. <laughs> um, Astro's Playroom looks adorable. Yes. Hey, you were excited about this. Yeah. So according to the PlayStation blog post, you can explore four worlds, each based on the PS5 console components, which I think is really neat. Each area showcases innovative gameplay that taps into the new features of the PS5's DualSense wireless controller. So when they revealed the PlayStation 4... The playroom was a tech demo for how the light bar would work on the new touchpad <laughs> with, the, with the dual sense or excuse me, with the dual shock Four controller with the PlayStation Eye camera. Right. And they obviously went on to make Astrobot uh, Rescue Mission for PlayStation VR. But these little guys were so fun at the at that tech demo. And I love showing people the playroom on PlayStation because it's so family friendly and it's great for little kids to be able to play with the controller and to kind of hang out with these little robots. So I think that it's great that they're sticking with them and that they're doing another game with them. And I will definitely play because cute games are cute. Yes. We all need some cute games right now. Yeah. Do we want to go to the cutest game? It's not the cutest. The weirdest game? Yes. The fucking weirdest game of all. Bucks next. Oh, yes, from Young Horses. Yeah. So, What's the name of it? Bug Snacks. Bug Snacks. So Young Horses oh, yeah. is a team oh, yeah. that you may remember made a little game called Octodad mm-hmm. that blew up, and that team decided they wanted to make another game, and they have been quietly working on this for quite some time. And I remember talking to um, P. Tibbs about it, um, one of the co-founders of Young Horses, and when we originally talked about it, he kind of pitched me the idea of what the game was. And I was like, dude, this sounds amazing. And so this started out with the little strawberries. Mm-hmm. And then this, what is that? Like a beaver? It's a walrus, a my walrus? dear. Hard to tell. It's standing <laughs> Not up. hard to tell. It's That's a walrus. A hat, okay? It's 100% a walrus. It's got a bushy mustache. Beavers have tusks too. <laughs> Listen, Brittany. <sighs> Don't so yeah, the walrus the eats a strawberry and then his arm turns into a couple of strawberries and it's weird. Yeah, and then was like, you are what you eat. Yes, I mean, that that, if the that's not the tagline line. of this, I don't know why, because yeah. it should be. Because literally, the more you eat of the other stuff, the more it changes your character. Then they had a little weird like jingle song to it that I don't remember how it goes, but there was definitely a, a jingle in this, which I thought was funny. Bugs next. Uh, it also has a very satisfying name to say. Bug snacks. Bug snacks. I thought someone said this game was kickstarted. It must not must have been a different one. This game I thought was, there was not kickstarted. Yeah. There was one in chat. Someone said it was in Kickstarter in 2015, but obviously it wasn't this one. But it looks like the island is filled with a hundred different species of creatures, and you'll be able to capture and collect each one. They also feature different biomes. You'll be able to customize your favorite ones. You'll learn more about the origins of the island and the creatures that live there. Huzzah. Huzzah. It's fucking weird, but I'm into it. 
I'm into it. I have to say the strawberries with the googly eyes kind of get me though. It's a and little the way uh, he just like popped them in his mouth. I was like, oh no, they're definitely still alive. This is like some Little Mermaid flashbacks when Ursula just eats the shrimp, and they're all cowering in fear. This is a interesting, and then there's a donut that's walking around at some point, and I thought of you too, Steimer. And there's a like weird the thing with a cinnamon roll head. Ooh, I don't know, but I'm into it. Roll. I yeah, no, a cinnamon roll sounds delicious. I'm all the way into this. I'm excited to see this quirky game. Bring it on! Give me the snacks. Okay, so the next game um, I wanted to talk about was Project Athea. As we mentioned, Gary Wooda uh, announced today that he is writing on it. So this is the working title, according to the PlayStation blog, that Luminous Productions has been working on. Um, and so the write-up on the blog says that it's the culmination of a philosophy here at Luminous Productions to create completely new and fresh gaming experiences that fuse together the latest technologies with art. With PS5, our vision truly comes to life. Okay, okay, okay. This is PR marketing talk. Well, Let me blog, skip so. here. It's going to be action-packed, you guys. And at oh. times, twisted. Temet, temp, temet, tempestuous. tempestuous. Wow, that was a word. Why? Why you got to use that word? Tempestuous and Ugh. forbidding. It's a journey that we want to feel as much as yours as it is our protagonist. So cool. this is about all we know. They're not saying much more about it. We got a cool look at it. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit already. Yeah. But the, the minimal that we have. Yeah. We got nothing. We, we, got, we got scraps. We don't have our bug snacks yet. We need the bug snacks Ooh, later. Bug snacks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, continuing on. Brittany, what's next? Um, that's a great question. Yeah, I'm cheer like, for the ride. So why have we not talked about that's what I'm wondering. I guess we haven't talked about Sackboy a big adventure. Yeah, I only briefly really mentioned cute. it. We didn't talk about that one either. No, we didn't. Okay. okay. So Sackboy a big adventure. I'm trying to look I mean, at it like a little like It's more a little big planet. It's Sackboy. Yeah. It's his friends. So you, it looks like up to four player co op, which is nice. Um, think and of if you've Super ever Mario three D worlds, but with Sackboy. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Looks You'll have cute. all the fun customizations it looks like it, that you did in prior Little Big Planets because somebody was like a bird and somebody else was like had Sailor Moon bun hair with, with really fun colors. And so, yeah, it's still it looks. I don't want to say it, it, it is what it sounds like, basically, if you've ever played those games. Yeah. yeah. We didn't hear if there's going to be a UGC component that, of course, has been a huge part of Little Big Planet over the years. I think not because of the name. Because it's not Little Big Planet, hmm. it's Sackboy's Sack Boy, Sack Big, Boy adventure. Big Adventure. So I don't kind of like how Minecraft Dungeons. Yeah, interesting. Like, that's my guess. Yeah, I don't think that that's a bad thing. Obviously, Media Molecule has got their hands full of dreams right now, so that's probably what they're focusing on. In fact, I don't think Media Molecule this, is making this. They didn't make this game. Um, a I don't remember studio. The, yeah, is I don't remember the it. game. But, or the not the game. Let the me developer. see if I can find it. <laughs> I can't find it. Yeah. Um, okay, continuing on, another game that was announced is called. Oh, you want to talk about Goodbye Volcano? Sure. Hi, Goodbye Volcano High or Goodbye, Jet the Far Shore? Goodbye Volcano High, because it'll be brief, because this yeah. we also don't know almost anything about. Um, it kind of just looked. It did have very, like, a Life is Strange esque soundtrack going on to it. Um, and then there were, like, anthropomorphic dinosaurs slash animals in high school of some kind, but you really got almost no understanding of what type of game it was. So I'm not sure if any of the articles have any more information, but it, the style of it seems interesting. We just don't really know what it is. So on the PlayStation blog, it says for the past two years, we've been hard at work making good by volcano high, a cinematic choice based narrative game set in the final year of high school for a bunch of dinosaur teens dinosaurs. on the on the cusp of graduation and the rest of their lives. You'll follow them as they struggle to make their mark on the world, figure out who they're going to be, try to find love, all before time yep. runs out and they're thrust into the world of adulthood. At first I thought they were going to say, gonna say time before runs time runs out and a big old comes. meteor comes and fucking fucks them all up. But Dude, I'm glad they didn't go there. Right there on the same page with you, Brittany. <laughs> I was like, oh, God. It's going to um, end but, like the TV show Dinosaurs did, where there's oh, just, like shit. impending doom. <laughs> You're like, oh, God. no. <laughs> but what they don't know yet is that time might be. Oh, fuck. Oh, but, no. what they don't... <laughs> but what they don't know yet is that time might be about to run out for real. Oh, shit. Oh, it's going to pull a dinosaur. We're all lost and scared and not sure what happens next. We're hoping that the story resonates with people. Dang, that's deep. Hot diggity dog. I mean, I'll still play this. This sounds interesting. It is like a Life is Strange sort of game, but with dinosaurs. And a meteor, <laughs> apparently. Add, I mean, 
Asteroid. Yeah, I was I was a huge fan of the TV shows Dinosaurs, so <laughs> I'm all oh, about this. Oh, what's going for the deep cuts reference? Yeah, dude, that's how that show ended. I'm not surprised that they would use a meteor to end this game. Yeah. Um, wow. Okay, continuing on, and there's a we can kind of run through some of these smaller titles that we didn't get to see much about. I'm going to try to pull up a definitive list of everything that's confirmed for holiday. Mm. So we've got Jet the Far Shore. Uh, we just mentioned... Uh, we just mentioned Goodbye Volcano High. There's also uh, Solar Ash. That looks cool. Um, which looks really cool. And we've got um, Stray, which we talked about already. And then Are you looking for indies? Yeah, just okay. a smaller. So the Pathless? Did we talk about the Pathless? I don't, don't even remember so. what that was. What was that? Uh, let's see. It all kind of blend into one game after a while. I don't think this... Was this on there? Giant Squid? I don't remember. What? Yeah. Well, maybe this was announced originally for PlayStation 4. I think this... We finally get to announce it. The Pathless will be released later this year and not just on PS4. We'll be launching on PS5 too. Was this in the show? I feel like this was not in the show. Maybe I don't got, remember maybe seeing got this. cut from the show. But they were like, we'll still do a blog post. Yeah, because I don't remember this being part of it. Unless, I mean, I could be forgetting, but... I don't, I don't remember either. So that's from Giant Squid, uh, The Pathless. And then um, Tribes of Midgard also makes its console debut on PlayStation 5. So I believe that is currently available on PC, but it's not coming until 2021. Okay. Now that we've got some of the smaller titles out of the way, we've got two big boys to talk about. Which one you want to talk about first? You want to talk about cool robots or you want to talk about scary <laughs> Britney pick. dudes I'll talk about Resident Evil oh, okay. so we can end the Let's discussion go. on something we all understand which is Horizon oh, that's a good idea okay uh, hmm. so I've seen this trailer now probably like five or six times and I've each time watched it kind of frame by frame to try to figure out like what the fuck is happening so Resident Evil 8 Village had kind of been a long rumor title we had heard from Dust Golem uh, the Twitter person who seems to know all things related to Capcom titles, that this game was going to be a significant departure from what we're used to. And, you know, th this person is pretty credible when it comes to the rumors. Obviously, they're also convinced that there's a Silent Hills game in the works. Who knows? In the works, who knows? But so uh, let me take a deep breath here because, I have, oh, boy, there's a lot here going on. So the story, so the trailer opens up. And it starts with his story comes to a close. And you're like, okay, what the hell does that mean? And then there's like this weird exchange between a man and a woman. Essentially, the, the woman says, long ago, a young girl went to her mother, went with her mother to pick berries for her father, who was hard at work. But the forest greeted them with a dark, cold silence. The bushes were empty. Yet determined to find the berries, the rascal broke free of her mother's grasp and vanished into the trees. Mother's worried cries faded fast as the girl ran on over vine, under branch, and into the forest deep. And then you hear a man's voice cut in, and he says, what's up with that creepy story? We're assuming that's Ethan and Mia from Resident Evil 7. They're having some banter, and then we find out through the official Capcom blog that they have moved on or had tried to move on from their shenanigans in Resident Evil 7 to live a, a normal, peaceful life. And of course, all of that kind of comes crashing down. And because um, what is a good horror story if you don't have people getting fucked over royally? You know what I mean? True. You got to have some shit going down. Yeah, if you're going to be in th that kind of a story, nothing good's going to happen to you. So this is through the, from the press release. So Resident Evil Village is scheduled for a 2021 release on PS5, Xbox Series X, and Steam. Set a few years after the critically acclaimed RE7 Biohazard, the all-new storyline begins with Ethan and his wife Mia living peacefully in a new location, free from the past nightmares. <laughs> Just as they are building their new life together, tragedy befalls them once again. Chris Redfield, the legendary hero from the Resident Evil series, who made a brief appearance in Resident Evil 7, is reacquainted with a couple and horribly disrupts their life, leaving Ethan devastated and thrown into an entirely new nightmare. Nightmare. The first person action in Resident Evil Village begins when the players assume the role of a distraught and shattered Ethan as he seeks to uncover the mysterious new horrors that plague a once peaceful village. Players will fight for every breath, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so going back to what I was talking about when you had that man and the woman kind of reading that story and bantering. Yeah. So it looks like that that's Ethan and Mia kind of living their new life. And then toward the end of the trailer, you see, because I checked the backgrounds of the frames mm -hmm. to make sure that it was the same location, like the TV and the picture frames were all yeah. in the same spot. So I was like, okay. Uh, Chris Redfield walks in, 
and he's wearing like all black and he looks to his left or his right, shoots a woman several times on the ground, assuming it's Mia. It looks like Mia says, I'm sorry, Ethan. And Ethan just goes, why? And that's kind of like, what the fuck is happening? Why is Chris coming after Ethan and Mia? And that's kind of the main question. My theory is that at the end of Resident Evil 7, spoilers, this game came out in 2017. You can finish it. Uh, end of Resident Evil 7, Ethan, there's two endings you can have. But clearly Capcom's taking the reins and they're saying we're going to make this ending canon where mm -hmm. Ethan and Mia lived, li live, leave together. That was a fucking live struggle. Live and leave together. Live and leave together. Yeah. yeah. Via helicopter, they escape the new biohazard uh, risk of the mold. They're supposed to go try to live happily ever after. However, we all thought that Ethan is infected with the mold because he has hallucinations. Somehow his like arm is cut off and able to be reattached. No problem. Like... It, Weird things happen. All things that are symptoms of being infected with the component in Resident Evil 7. So the fact that he and Mia try to go off and live this normal life, like, oh, no. So my theory is that they go off. They have a child because there's a few shots of what looks to be Mia holding a baby. And this baby has, you know, Ethan's DNA, which is probably corrupted by the mold. Right. Right. And now this baby is some weird, like, demonic mold, evil biohazard baby. Ooh. There's, that's just my Spooky thought here. Baby. And so Chris is coming. Baby. Chris is like, oh Chris hell like, no, I'm, I'm a kill Redfield. the spooky baby. Yeah, I hope. Fuck, I hope not. And what I'm do you thinking mean you the hope that's probably what you do. <laughs> I don't know what he does. I maybe the baby gets kidnapped. I don't know. But I think he comes to put an Mr. end X. because he's like, all of you are fucked. Like something's going on for him to come back and kill Mia, and and. I, I, obviously, he doesn't kill Ethan. We don't know if Ethan escapes or whatnot, but we know for sure it looks like he tries to kill Mia. So now Ethan, Ethan is in this weird and escapes <laughs> this weird village. And there is some developer commentary um, with Peter Fabiano with another producer on Capcom for this game, and they showed a piece of key art, and they said like we even debated not showing this key art. Like, ha, ha you're getting us your you know PR mumbo jumbo. But but the the key art looks like there's four black wings so imagine a circle mm -hmm. I, it's on my twitter account if you want to look at it but it's like a golden circle there's like this weird demonic fetusy looking thing in the middle and then sprouting off of that are four black wings and if you see that if you look at it and if you go frame by frame through the reveal trailer you see that same symbol painted on walls and looks like on floors throughout the game kind of like something a cult would do so my thought is that this village is fucked up they're worshiping this baby because apparently this baby probably has some weird biohazard thing wrong with it. And now Ethan is like, what the fuck is all this shit? And then he has to try to get out without getting killed. Wait, but like, there's other people in this village? Yeah. So, oh God. Yeah. That's, thank you. So okay. we do see some, <laughs> I told you there's so much here. Okay. So there are what looks to be a two of be normal people in this village. The, the, the trailer opens up and it's this old man. He's like, oh, they're coming. And Ethan's like, who's coming? Uh, and so there's werewolves. So you see like werewolves like running around outside. One of them pulls Ethan through a wall. I'm pretty sure. Um, it looks like there is um, vampires, like women. They look like vampires because there's like these little bat things flying around. And so you're like, have, like, there's normal people. And then you're like, there's werewolves and vampires. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm getting to the exciting stuff. I think obviously there are normal people in the sense that like you see split seconds of people going, oh, no. Or, oh, my goodness. And if you go through some of the rumors that Dusk Golem has provided, it sounds like there's going to be some new uh, protagonists introduced. And I'm assuming those are going to be the new people. But I'm assuming the, the normal good people are heavily outweighed by like the vampires and the werewolves. And there's apparently new zombie types. At one scene, it looks like a zombie is tearing someone's like face off or something. I don't know. It looks fucking weird. And I have to say, like, the more I watch it, the more I'm here for it. I, it's gonna be. This is definitely feels like a new, a very very new direction that Capcom's taking Resident Evil. And in the, de the developer interview, it sounds like they are upping the action uh, for this game. So it's not gonna be so slow survival horror, -y, more like exploration actiony. So, uh, I, I don't know. I'm, 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 I have faith in Capcom, but this is going to be really interesting to see where they take it. If they do want to take it in a really weird direction right now, I'm like, okay, that's fine because I have a theory also that they're going to be expanding the Resident Evil 3 story on the side. So it's like, okay, go the normal route of Resident Evil and then go ahead and go down your weird ass route down this way and we'll see what happens. Hmm. <sighs> oh, God. There's so much. 
Well, <sighs> I feel so much better. You're like, good. Is it therapeutic? I, yeah, I needed to get all of that out. It's good. Thanks. Thanks, ladies. No problem. We're here for you. Um, <laughs> I'm glad that you were excited. It was definitely a fun moment, even though Steimer got mad at me because I was kept going full screen to get the reacts. Because normally what happens in the press conference is I'm sitting next to you ready to make gifts of your reactions. I know. We couldn't be there next to each other for, for this one. I but I hope you felt my energy, ladies. Oh, yes. yeah, for sure. I'm sure somebody <laughs> clipped something from that section of the stream, hopefully. I think Spelt Wrong Brit did. She tweeted it. Okay, nice. good. Um, there were a couple other smaller things that I forgot to mention. Um, there was Little Devil Inside from NeoStream Interactive, which is a Victorian-like are set in a Victorian-like era, embark on dangerous missions to gain evidence and findings for your employer, a mysterious professor. Uh, and then, oh, of course, that was a really weird. Uh, was it the really weird art style one where like yes. his face just looked like a like Cheshire a... cat with like the really long fangs? Oh wait, what? Uh -huh. I click on it. Uh -huh. I was thinking about what was this the protagonist with the weird googly eyes? Um, I don't. Maybe. Um, and oh wait, was that the one where it's like the art, the like the grass and the trees and everything looked super was real. realistic? But then and then the... like the character had like a weird oh, Minecraft face. Oh, uh, little devil inside. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. the one. Okay, yes. yeah, the art style of this game is very bizarre. So yes, the the environments look somewhat realistic but then the character models themselves are really goofy so you as the protagonist just have this fucking derp face that's so funny to watch and then all the creatures are, are fantastical as well versus being more realistic okay this was the game that was kickstarted it sounds like it was kickstarted years ago but never appeared it was once scheduled to release in 2016 on the wii u wow this game has taken a journey yeah, I mean, I'm happy it got delayed because I think if it was on the Wii U, probably never would have gotten, you know. No. <laughs> no. Get that PlayStation money. Um, and yeah. then we also didn't talk about Odd World Soulstorm. So I saw this game at Judges Week last year, and they have been clearly working hard at it. And when we saw it, they were very upfront. They were like, it's going to be a while. Uh, but that was last year. So we still don't have like a release window, but essentially it's the next installment in the Odd World franchise. So if you're big into odd world i think you're really going to enjoy this i thought that when i saw the game last year it looked really great they definitely had a lot of work to do on getting all the systems to play nice together because the build that we played was very much like very early pre-alpha build but the art style looks awesome and if you're into that whole narrative and the lore of odd world i think that you will be excited about what's coming down the pipeline for that Plus, we also saw NBA 2K21 from 2K Sports. Oh my God, yeah, there was so much in this conference. Yeah, yeah. so that's the pre-alpha PS5 uh, footage that we saw, obviously looking great. 2K, uh, NBA 2K as a franchise has been doing really cool things with graphics, and so no surprise that it's going to probably look amazing on the new consoles. And then we've talked about pretty much everything except... Uh -oh. <gasps> For Horizon Zero Dawn Dos. Yes, Horizon 2 Forbidden West. So the exact title of the game is Horizon Forbidden West. Got it. So everyone's going to call it Horizon 2, and they even put the little tick marks in the logo, but its technical title is Horizon Forbidden West. Yeah. Well, the Forbidden West looks beautiful because it was all tropical. But, like, it reminded me of, of, I've never been to Australia, but of what I imagine Australia to look like. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, well, it takes place in the west of, like, the west of Colorado and Utah. I think you see the Golden Gate. Is it the Golden Gate Bridge you see in the background for a split second toward the end? Do you? I think you do. Didn't I think I, I thought the very last frame. I'm pretty sure I, I, that's what I saw. The... Yeah, we'll have to, to take a, a look at it again. So the... it's. I'm trying to get all of the details from this. So what's interesting, to too, about the Forbidden West is that in Horizon Zero Dawn, the Forbidden West is alluded to, right? Like, I think the thought is that Ross even ventured there once to try to rescue his daughter or rescue his daughter either. Or, I don't know. I can't remember exactly. And there's some interesting data points in Horizon Zero Dawn that mention it. And there's a really good um, codex entry that you can find online and read about if you want. But essentially... Here's a little paragraph about it. It says, though each account differs, it is certain that the Western lands are most unlike our own. Some cross deserts of palest whites, other deserts of color fire, even limitless sweeps of blue sand that seem to reflect the sky above, broken only by the remains of ancient machines. And these machines are supposed to be far worse than the ones that we encountered in the first Horizon game. So it's exciting that we're going there. 
And I think that had been more or less the predictions for a hot minute. Yeah, I mean, I'm pumped. I'm so glad that we finally get to see it. This was one of our predictions, and we knew that something was coming from Horizon and Guerrilla Games, and I cannot wait. And so, yeah, they, they one of the things they showed off that looked really beautiful is uh, Aloy underwater. Oh, like, oh my God, her little rebreather, and <laughs> you're just like the water is so pretty. Yeah, Holy it's smokes. And you gorgeous. get to like, see beautiful coral reefs and stuff. And that, like, that's why I was talking about it reminds me of what Australia would be because they're known for their coral reefs. Um, but I guess, you know, if the world ended. Humans go to shit. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the there's... West would have a lot more. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a, there's kelp forests and coral reefs off the coast of California. It's just that you can't see most of them, especially near the coast because of pollution and yeah. dumping and a bunch of other terrible Oops. things. And a lot of them have been eroded. But it would be interesting to see how they would potentially flourish knowing that humans are gone for the, yeah. most, po- for the most part. And they showed off some really interesting new... Obviously, I feel like they've always done really well with their creature design. Um, just making them feel somehow grounded, but also fantastical. They have an interesting balance. So the, the my favorite one that they showed off in here was the big mammoth boy at the end. Yeah. Like, oh, like, yeah. So cool. Heck yes. Like, come on. I mean, like, also, no, I'm scared. Run away. But also, you look cool. <laughs> yeah, that giant warthog gave me some serious Puma vibes. Yeah. But, you know, he, fighting that thing is going to be a nightmare. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, like, also, and that really pretty tortoise mm, that rose oh, up. Oh, yeah. That reminded the- me of, um, of God of War when her house stands up oh yeah i was like oh but now i'm gonna have to hurt it <laughs> maybe yeah. not because there's some creatures that had red eyes though i'm pretty sure oh did it yeah i didn't catch that detail yeah it was dang mad. it we'll convert it it'll be our friend eventually like, hold on so there's a Override. clip of silence and he has a whole bunch of well not a whole bunch sorry there's like maybe five or six look like tribesmen and women around him and i'm assuming they're using the spear to convert the machine the machine has red eyes they shove the staff in there. The machine has yellow eyes. Would you assume that means that it's been tamed? Uh, usually that's what it means. That's usually right. Because the theory is, because I was going through Reddit to like, you know, look at all the theories, is that he's going to be the bad guy in this game. Oh, I mean, I mean, he's, yeah. I mean, of course. I mean, don't want to like spoilers, but like he breaks bad at the end of the last one. Um, so I'm excited. This is awesome. They did not give us a release date. I would guess that this is Q1 2021 or potentially Q2 2021. I don't think that this is this fall. I think they would have announced no, it was holiday for if sure. it was happening this fall. Yeah. It's possible, though, that maybe they have a milestone that they want to hit for polish and then they'll announce a release date. But my guess is it's early next year would be when Horizon is happening, especially if they're going to be promoting Spider-Man in fall of this year they probably don't want to put two of their big first party titles that close that to close, each other yeah yeah that so, makes sense but i'm super excited about that i want to quickly run down our eight ball predictions so when we did our <laughs> summer gaming predictions the first thing we asked is was the june 3rd event real and it said outlook good and like it kind of the kind of eight ball was think- kind of right yeah right? it was originally the fourth and then I got bumped. Right. So. Yeah. So the event that week was real, but then I got bumped. So the next question, will we get at a Horizon Zero Dawn 2? Most likely. That's a win. Good job, 8-Ball. Uh, will we see the console at this event? Yes. Well, that's a win. Will we get an announcement of Spider-Man 2? The 8-Ball said no, but they were obviously that, wrong. Yeah. Fuck you, 8-Ball. Just, you know. um, will we get an RE8 tease? It is certain. Good job, 8-Ball. Will we get a Gran Turismo launch for PS5? Yes, you may rely on it. We got that. Is PSVR 2 a thing at this event? My sources say no. 8-Ball was right there. Um, And then we have, will we get a Bloodborne 2 tease? Sources say no. So 8-Ball was right there as well. Yeah, we did get get Demon Souls. Like uh, oh, yes, either we, remake we or remaster, yeah. but we forgot to mention it because again, there was so much packed in this conference. Um, but yeah, so Shuhei came on and he talked about well, he didn't really talk about that. He basically just keyed it up and then there was a trailer and then that was kind of it. So they didn't really confirm if this was a remaster or a remake. Um, looks like it's a remake. Did they say that on the blog? Uh, a do- remake of Demon Souls is coming to PlayStation 5. Sony announced today. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would I would assume it would be a remake because I don't know why the hell they would do a remaster. That would make no sense. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you are a Demon Souls fan, you can look forward to playing it even prettier yeah, all they over said, again. What else did they say? I was looking. They said something else about it on the blog. Some details about Demon Souls. About According Demon to Sony, Souls. Demon Souls for PS5 has been entirely rebuilt from the ground up and masterfully enhanced. A release date go. was not announced. Yes. 
Correct. Yeah, there's supposed to be two new uh, ways you can play. You can choose to prioritize resolution or frame rate um, in the game, which is obviously very important to players who are very much trying to min-max their strats for combat in that game. And they have uh, a couple other technical things that they've announced for that as well. I'm just having trouble finding the exact language. But all in all... A fantastic showcase, some really cool things we got to see. I'm 100% excited for PlayStation 5 now that we've got, you know, Spider-Man confirmed for holiday and a bunch of these other games that look really neat. I don't have a definitive list yet of all of the games that are confirmed for holiday 2020, but we can talk about that next week on the show. Uh, There was other announcements that happened yesterday. So IGN is doing their summer of gaming with their IGN Expo. And day one yesterday had a bevy of announcements, mostly, you know, smaller um, indie or double A games. But Brittany, we have you to talk to us all about everything that was revealed for Yakuza Like a Dragon. Oh my God, it looks so good. And there's a crayfish named Nancy. Is that all we need to know? Yeah, I mean, that's literally all anyone ever needs to know (laughs) to like, you know, like get into this game. But no, so the main takeaway for me, because I'm I know I'm going to play this game surprising no one is I'm trying not to learn about the plot point. And at one point, oh, gosh, someone from um, the team was talking and they started talking about kind of like where the story was going. And I kind of tuned out after that. So what I did is I went to Yakuza, uh, Yakuza, PC Gamer. And I pulled some of the top things that they they found from the stream, and it was all it's all spoiler free. So the game's turn-based JRPG combat, which includes a job system, all takes place in the protagonist's head. He's imagining real fights as these absurd encounters are full of special moves. So apparently Ichiban is a fan of retro gaming, and nice. in order for him to I guess get in like the groove of fighting, is he just imagines all of this kind of stuff in his head, and that's how he applies. He's like fights to it, I guess. I yes. don't know. I think that's freaking yeah, crazy. It's like I gotta map it out first. Don't <laughs> yeah, worry. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, you can level up bonds between characters called drink links, Ooh. and with higher bonds, they'll do follow up attacks for you in combat. And it sounds like you can maybe romance other characters <gasps> in the game. So I'm like, it's, okay, it's, we're getting like a little persona ish with our with a our, little with our links yeah. with our. But I like. Drink Links is actually a very cute name. It's really cute. There are 19 jobs. Each have their own unique outfits, like classes, I'm assuming. That's what it's going to mean. And then the new set in Yokohama is apparently three times the size of Kamurocho with nine different districts, which is just absolutely insane to me. I thought Kamurocho was big enough, but hey, I guess you can always go three times bigger. <laughs> okay. And there's a, there's a significant business management mode where you take over a failing confection, confectionery company and turn it into a great... Great Holdings Company, <laughs> and it'll include some epic shareholder battles. And there's Dragon Cart and Can Quest, which are racing mini games. In Can Quest, you pick up cans and rickshaw and try to out collect other can collectors. Um, I mean, the sure. more I see of this game, it's just I, I can't wait. You know, that's the beauty of the series is that it has some really the main narrative is really intense, and there's some super deep and impactful moments. I've cried several times while playing these games, but you have this off the wall, goofy side content that just really, you know, lightens the mood up and. Uh, it sounds like we're going to be getting a lot of that. I'm really excited, obviously. Yeah. We still have a, a release date. They keep saying day and date for the new consoles, but if I had to guess, I'd say it's just probably coming out maybe in a few months or so. Wait, so this is one of the games that's coming to current gen before next gen, right? I'm assuming, and this is they're being really cagey with the wording of it. They're saying, you know, at first, because it, it was only confirmed for Xbox... Um, Oh, what's it called? Series X? Yeah, but the, the thing where you buy it, you can play it on oh, the other one. Yes. No, the backwards compatible no. one. That are, I forget what Smart you're talking Smart delivery. About. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, like, I forget the yeah. name of it, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's going to be part of that. And then they just officially announced not that long ago that, of course, it's coming to PS5 as well and PS4 and Xbox One. But they're saying on the same day that it's going to release for all of these. And like, how does... But... but yeah, so I don't know why they're not giving a release date. I really don't understand it because we're already halfway through June. Well, if, so they, unless... yeah, if they're holding it to launch it on launch day for PS5 or Xbox Series X, that they can't give the release date because the platformers have it. The platform. Well, no, they're saying they're going to release on the same. They're all going to release like on the same day is what it sounds like. But maybe that's what they're also. Maybe that's what they're saying is like it's going to release on PS5 first or Xbox first. We don't know. See why I'm like confused here? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah it doesn't make. It'll any all sense. become clear. I'm sure. I would guess that they're going to announce a to... date by the end of the summer. Typically, E3, if we don't see dates at E3 announcements and their holiday, we get them at Gamescom because that's another major marketing beat that's directly ahead of the holiday season big spend that we usually see retailers doing. So hopefully we'll know by the end of the summer. I want it. And Simer, you'll appreciate this. Apparently, there's 252 Sujimon, and you can become a Sujimon master if you collect these dangerous beings that are called Sujimon. Nice. First, he challenges the green, red, and blue kind, and then it's an encyclopedia, and you build it up like a Pokedex. Oh, my I, God. I just, yeah. Uh, I just need it, it so bad. Cool. Yeah. Whew, that was a lot. And there certainly was some other news that happened this week. But of course, we are focusing on this massive PlayStation reveal event. And not to discredit any of the games that were announced at IGN's Expo Day 1. There's just like so much to cover. We just cannot cram it all into one episode of our show. But we are looking forward to doing even more next week. Because next week's going to be another massive show with more watch-alongs. I'm going to be creating a streaming uh, a streaming schedule calendar that I'm going to put up for you guys so you know exactly when we're going to be live on our Twitch channel and you can watch along with us. But I do want to do a quick follow-up on a story that Brittany and I talked about on the Monday show, which is the bundle for racial justice and equality that itch.io has been blasting out. So their initial fundraising goal for this bundle that we talked about was, I can't remember, it was, what was the initial goal? It was like a I couple hundred. Five million. It was a couple oh, hundred I don't thousand. The, I don't remember the original um, goal. But they're over $5 million now in their fundraising effort, which is phenomenal. The bundle originally had around 742 games, I want to say, and now has yeah. over 1,000. And it says that it includes more than 1,500 works from at least 1,198 creators. So they're adding more games to this bundle all the time. And it's raising money for the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund and the Community Bail Fund, Proceeds from the fundraiser will be split 50-50 between the two organizations. And Polygon added that as more money is raised, itch.io continues to update the bundle with more games and projects. All people who donated will gain access to the additional games added to the original bundle, regardless of when you originally donated as part of this campaign, which is amazing. And from the date of recording, so if you guys are listening to the podcast on Friday, you have just a couple of days left to get in on this bundle. It's a phenomenal offering of games, and it all goes to a great cause. They so. just added Pyre from Supergiant, which is a Ooh, very cool game. I that just game saw that on awesome. Twitter, and I was like, oh, shit, yeah. So there's a, I mean, the, ga the game list is by well, yeah, me. it's obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you said it over, yeah. over a thousand. So yeah, yeah. I, so I'm definitely not going to run down these games. No, 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 there's no. Just way There's way too many. <laughs> yeah, I just saw that in a tweet that Supergiant said that today. So I was like, oh, that's cool. I wanted to bring that up. Yeah, so I just wanted to give them a shout out and a big thanks to everybody who's been putting that together and all of the developers who are bringing their games to that bundle to help fundraise for those two fantastic charities. So that is going to do it for our news segment. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk about The Last of Us Part 2. Spoiler free, of course. We'll see you guys soon. What's good, everybody? Welcome back. It's segment two of the What's Good Games podcast. As we mentioned at the top of the show, we are taping everything a little bit out of order today. And so we actually taped this segment before we taped the first segment so that we could do the PlayStation 5 watch along with you. But we still have things to talk about, like what we've been playing, because Steimer has been playing a game that everybody is talking about this week, The Last of Us Part 2. Part 2. <laughs> But before we do that, I want to tell you that it's brought to you by ExpressVPN. I know most of you are probably thinking, I search for things on the internet that I don't want anybody else to know about. Admit it. You've done it. We've all done it. Incognito mode is normally your best friend. Or is it? Dun, dun, dun. Let me tell you something about your browsing history, everybody. Your internet service provider can still see every single website you've ever visited. I know. Embarrassing, right? Well, that's why when I'm at home, I never go online without using ExpressVPN. 
So let me tell you a story about one night when I was in a girl's chat and there was a talk about deep fakes. I had no idea what deep fakes were. And so one Maria convinced me to Google search for deep fakes. And boy, oh boy, have I regretted that decision <laughs> ever since. Because let me tell you, those cookies have been following me everywhere. <laughs> If oh, only no. I had just turned my Express VPN on before I got convinced to search for deep fakes, but also did not realize there are some really convincing deep fake adult entertainment out there. Like very convincing. There was this one with Taylor Swift that I could have swore was her. Could have swore. Oh. Except she had a weird Russian accent, so <laughs> probably Wasn't. not. Was that the was, giveaway? <laughs> what was the giveaway? I was like, oh, doesn't feel like it's T-Swift in this video. Anyway, I digress. It doesn't matter if you get your internet from Verizon or Comcast or if you're like me and you get it from Spectrum here in the Los Angeles area. ISPs in the U.S. can legally sell your information to ad companies. That's right. Get mad about it. Write your local congressperson. ExpressVPN, though, is here to help you. In the meantime, with an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure server so your ISP can't see the sites you visit. ExpressVPN also keeps all of your information secure by encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. Most of the time, I don't even realize that I have ExpressVPN on. Sorry, everybody. That was my ring doorbell. There's a plumber here. <clears throat> Man, and I just cut in somewhere. ExpressVPN also keeps all of your information secure by encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. Most of the time, I don't even realize I have ExpressVPN on. It runs seamlessly in the background and is easy to use. And all you have to do is tap one button and you're protected. ExpressVPN is available on all of your devices, phones, computers, and even your smart TV. So there's no excuse to not be using it. Protect your online activity today with a VPN rated number one by CNET and Wired. We like those websites. Visit our exclusive link at expressvpn.com slash what's good games. And you can get an extra three months free on a one year package. That's expressvpn.com slash what's good games. Expressvpn.com slash what's good games to learn more. Okay. Steimer. Hmm. Yes, you have had your <laughs> copy of The Last of Us for quite some time. And full yes. disclaimer, PlayStation, Sony Interactive Entertainment provided a pre-release promotional copy for our review. So thank you to Sony for sending that over. Disclaimer done. Yes. And you have now finished the game. Yes. And this will <gasps> be a spoiler-free conversation. I'm a spoil. I'm just kidding. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it will definitely <gasps> be spoiler-free. I think that's actually one of the harder things. It's going to... I will talk slowly basically is what's going to happen <laughs> we will have, I, have faith friends if she does an accidental spoiler i will have edited it out by the time it gets to you it's not only that like i obviously am i'm smart enough to like not say story spoilers right. but for me i think one of the magical parts about going into this game was uh i managed to avoid all of like the previous whatever internet leak spoilers so i actually don't even know how accurate they are because i just never saw them um so I didn't see any of that. I had stopped watching their trailers a couple trailers ago. I was just like, you know what? No, I want to just go into this game. And I'm really glad that I did, actually, because I think for me, once I know that I'm interested in a game, I actually don't want to see anything more from it, at, especially, I don't know, this stage of my life. I don't know. Maybe it's an old person thing. <laughs> but You're I, not an old person. Oh, back in my day, we watched all the trailers and we got all the information from the PR and then we played the game. No, um, but, so, <laughs> um, but yeah, so like it's more of making sure that I don't overstep when I will eventually start talking about themes of the game. Yeah. Because wanting to make sure that if you do, so I think how I'm going to handle this is I'll talk more about the structure of, um, you know, gameplay features and lighting and all that kind of crap, like stuff that really has nothing to do with the story. And we can run through all of that. And then I can touch on themes. And then that way, if you're like, I kind of want to go in a little bit more dark, you can stop listening then. Um, and then you can just, you know, go about your merry life. I think that sounds like a good plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So general broad strokes in the beginning, and then we'll give another more contextual warning but again if you want to be like Steimer and going completely blind check the timestamps on the podcast and jump ahead to the next topic yes um i think if you were uh looking forward to this game at all 
just play the game. You'll be. That's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> there you go. That's all you need. To that's know. your two second review. All right. That's why I'm here. I'm, that's why I'm on the show. I'm out. Goodbye. Yeah. yeah like Brittany's just like, <laughs> I'm done. I want to hear nothing more. No, I totally, I totally get that. Um, we can talk about one of the main features. They actually had a little bit of a PR beat last week for um, that I was very pleasantly surprised by when I hopped into the game, and that is their accessibility options. In The Last of Us OG, uh, the first game, there wasn't really a lot. Like You had difficulty settings, and I feel like, granted, I haven't fired that game up in a long time, but I feel like that was pretty much it. Like They didn't really have a whole heck of a lot going on in terms of making sure um, people with you know either visual or hearing disabilities or anything like that could play the game, um, and they've really amped that up. So yes, there are. They still have like the standard difficulty settings. So they have like four, baby, baby, yes, baby mode is what I'll call it. Nice. Uh, baby, yes, baby mode, just the one baby. And then they have just like normal, and then like go kill yourself. It's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> These are my own interpretations of what those difficulty levels are called. They're not called that. Um, but and then if you actually hop into option settings, is where you can really start to fine tune how you want to play the game or whether or not you do have hearing issues or whatever, uh, visual, like colorblind or whatever. Um, so I went in and kind of fucked, st- futz, futz? I was going to say futz and then it turned into a partial fuck. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> a partial um, fuck. <laughs> fucked around. <laughs> I futzed around in the menus and like, there's a lot of really interesting things in there. So you can kind of, um, you can mess with their AI, like the enemy AI so that, if you don't want to be flanked, maybe you do. You have an uh, issue with hearing, like I don't know. Mm. I can't think of the f- proper term but where it's like this side, like oh, peripheral, peripheral hearing issue or anything like that. You're like just don't want to deal with people coming at you from the side. You can turn that off. Wow. Um, you can turn off a couple of other things too. There had like a whole list I was gonna read off of from. Uh, I can pull that up for you. I have it. Uh, or okay. It's reloading now because it's the internet. But That's interesting. I don't know if I've ever heard of a game having that option. Yeah. You can turn so off the ability to be flanked. There are presets. So if you are blind or have low vision um, or if you have mobility disabilities or hearing issues, like they have some presets you could just select. Um, alternate controls so you can remap the buttons. Um, HUD scaling to help players change the size of HUD elements like text. Colorblind mode. Uh, camera shake customization for those prone to motion sickness navigation assistance so that the camera will face sort of in the direction you just go, um, enhanced listen mode so you can scan for items while in listen mode. Um, they also have like skip puzzle options or infinite breath for breathing underwater. I didn't oh. actually, I actually missed that. I didn't see that anywhere in there. Um, and then they have like text to speech, audio technology, um, and then combat accessibility, which is the stuff I was talking about where you can, um, you can fine tune like the amount that they will perceive you, that enemies will perceive you. Uh, one of them being like, if you go fully prone, like on the ground, that like, you're technically kind of invisible. So you can just like army crawl your way around I if you really want love, to. I love, love, love that they included that. Not only for people like me who fully embraces baby ass baby mode because I want to and choose to, but for the thousands of gamers out there that suffer from a variety of disabilities that want to be able to embrace these games and want to be able to experience the storytelling. Thank you, Naughty Dog, for thinking of them. I am looking forward to hearing from Steve Saylor about what he thinks about the game. And of course, our friends at Able Gamers, they have people on their editorial staff that evaluate games for disabilities as well. So looking forward to hear what they have to say if they actually think that these are helpful. But just the fact that they took the time to put them in there, I think is a win. And I hope more developers do that as well. Yeah, it was, it was very, um, a very nice surprise when I went in there and kind of saw how much there was to mess around with. I didn't mess around too much with it. Um, in the sense that like, didn't go deep diving through all the different options. Um, but I mostly cause I just wanted to get in the game. <laughs> I was yeah. like, let's go. Sorry. Um, but I did, I did turn, I, okay. I baby ass baby moded it for a very particular reason. We live in high stress times right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of uncertainty going around in the world. The last thing I really wanted was to artificially inflate my stress more with gameplay. So I did play on one of the lighter, I didn't play on the lightest easy, the easiest not mode. baby I, baby not yes. baby baby i played on like semi baby mode and okay. then i did turn off like no one could flank me um i think that was it i think i did awesome. one other thing that i don't remember 
it may have been just like people. Oh, I think I just turned on the ability so I could see when they were going to see me um, because that's an option in there too. So, oh, thank God. Uh, I'm so bad at stealth. That's great. Yeah. Thank Cause you. I was like, I mostly just wanted the meter to know, like, am I about to get right? Do I need to retreat into the do grass. I, yeah, yeah. Do I need to like Homer Simpson away here. Um, <laughs> But so I, I did mess around with a couple of those things uh, and that was nice. And it definitely made me feel like I could play the game the way I wanted to play the game, which is something, again, that I always really appreciate um, because it just means like you have less hurdles of getting through the story. And The Last of Us Part Two is always all about the story. Um, anytime you have like a Naughty Dog game, a lot of that is is why you go into it, right? You're just like you want to get immersed in the world. You want to learn about the characters and you want to be taken on a little journey. Um, so if you're constantly just like kicking yourself in the pants because you can't get through a certain level, that usually detracts from it. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, so that that's the accessibility options out of the way. So if you're looking at this game, it's it really is just like, it's stupid gorgeous. The lighting effects are insane. You just like, there's a they, and the way that they play with it is really pretty. Like they have a lot of God, God lighting kind of coming in from different angles, whether or not you're outside or even in a building. Um, the other thing I really enjoyed was sort of um, like even in the grass, yes, like the blades of grass move. Cool, fun. They've done that for a while, <laughs> but like now they have like little grasshoppers and things that'll just like pop out of the grass sporadically. Aww. And you're like, oh, it's just like they added so many nice little visual elements to help make the world feel natural and alive, which I really appreciated. Like I was walking through this one time, like a squirrel, a squirrel ran by or whatever, or like sometimes a rabbit will run by and you're just like, Oh shit. That's right. Like <laughs> there are living creatures in this world. Um, <laughs> so I really enjoyed that more, uh, touches like that. Um, but honestly, I mean, I think as, as anybody knows, if you're looking at a naughty dog game, you're like, the visuals are going to be one of the strongest elements. And they definitely kept that up here. I Would think, you say it's the prettiest PS4 game you've seen? The prettiest PS4 game? I don't, I'm not qualified enough to make that sort of a statement. But it uh, was, is it the prettiest game you've seen? In, like, in, in, in forever? And like, just, sure. Yeah. Sure. I don't know. I feel like okay, probably because like for me, there's different art styles or different things like sure. that I would take into consideration before. But I think that I think maybe what Brittany's trying to say is as far as photorealism is concerned in video games, do you think that Naughty Dog is pushing the envelope with what they did with The Last of Us Part, part Two with animation? I feel like they're um, was that correct, princi- their principal characters, as always, look incredible. They are animated to perfection. Um, and you will notice that and you'll see it both, um, in cutscenes and then in just the regular gameplay. Um, I will say like, I felt a little bit less excited about that in characters that were not principal characters. Mm. Um, so, but mostly like talking about like the people kind of like standing around, (laughs) right? Like those people don't always look the best to me personally. Uh, but I also don't care because they are just like not even a tertiary person. You're just like a nobody. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You are literally a space filler. So I don't really care. Um, But yeah, so I would, I would say that that was how I personally felt about the character design anyway. Um, But I also really appreciate it. So one of the really nice things I felt like they did with this game is there's pretty much, there's one loading scene and that is as you load into the game. So you will just load into the game and then you seamlessly move between cutscenes and gameplay so there's very little pausing. So you don't have to, well, not very little, there is no pausing. <laughs> I mean, you could pause the game, but uh, not like in other games where um, I was watching uh, John play Outer Worlds for a little bit. And I was like, oh God, I forgot how like every time you move yeah. into a building or out of a building, you hit a loading screen and how much that can take you out of the experience. And I, I really appreciate that Naughty Dog worked really hard to make sure that that was not an issue here. Um, so yeah, it all flows very seamlessly. And you won't ever be like, there's no time to be like, I'm going to check my phone now. Cause like, I'm just staring at a screen that has some rotating facts through it. I feel like you're trigger- <laughs> like you're triggering me right now. Cause I oh. always check my phone and load. No, screens. but that's what the, that's <laughs> always what happens. I feel like yep. anytime I play a game and it's takes you into a loading screen, 
I'm, I just grab my phone. It's just like a, it's just a habit. You just do it. I have 30 and, seconds to kill. <laughs> yeah. Going on. It's stupid, but it's, it's what happens. One scroll through Twitter. Let's go. Yeah. You're like, okay. And then you end up spending like five or six minutes, even though you're just like stand, your character's just standing there and they're like, what am I doing? What, what's going on? <laughs> um, so that's not an issue here. Um, again, so tech wise, fantastic job. Um, heart you. Thank you. I'm trying to think of other, do you guys have like tech questions or gameplay questions? I can hop into gameplay in a minute, but if you have anything about what I've already talked about. Um, well, we talked a little bit about it already, but combat, how did it feel overall for you playing on the difficulty setting that you did? Did you think that it felt rewarding? Did it feel too difficult? Did it lean into the stealth and survival elements that you were hoping it did so again i did play on one of the lighter modes um so i can't speak to the higher ones i imagine it would be a lot harder to stealth, stealth around um but the way i played on i really liked because i still had there were like a couple quote unquote like harder encounters where i did die still even on the lighter mode because i honestly just fucked it up let's be honest like that was just my that was my fault like i can't blame the game um, sometimes you just panic and run into a corner and die that just happens yeah. um, <laughs> yep yep uh and so but overall how i usually prefer to play at least a last of us game like how i played the first game um is i do try to stealth it as much as possible i don't really i very I think I only went in guns blazing once because I was just like, you know what? Screw it. Uh, <laughs> but usually I'm like, always, you're always doing the, those weird squat crawl. Like, and you're mm. just kind of like trying to maneuver your way around and grab somebody. And um, I love Ellie switch bait. You just like stab them. You're like, dead. You're dead. Great. So um, face tanking isn't an option for me, is what you're saying. I mean, you could try, but like, even on the quote unquote easier mode, um, yes, resources are easier to find and I never really struggled too hard with it, but like you will, ammo is still hard. Um, so I had a lot of crafting stuff, but I never necessarily found like heaps and heaps of ammo. Um, so you do need to make sure you are, you're managing and rationing your ammo. Cause otherwise you're just going to be like, I've got That's a gun fair. with no clips. So they <laughs> come at me. <laughs> well they expanded the gun system this time around right like the way that you can modify your guns yes. and how that plays into the skill progression so you have um yeah you can you can go through and you can find there's a few things you can find in the world um you can find crafting uh elements so like bottles or alcohol or rags similar to the first game and that's how you craft med kits or how you'd craft your silencer um for your pistol and then you have just parts, which is how you upgrade your guns. So those are just like a like a cog wheel or whatever is something you pick up. Um, and then you find pills. So, you know, mama likes to pop her pills. So pills of any kind you are going around and finding. And the pills will feed into your character's skill tree. Um, and you can also find books around the world that will unlock new paths so like as you start um you really only have one tree you can build into but then if you find these different uh books journals whatever then that opens up another one another path so i think i opened up four or five yeah i think that was so four or five i do not remember if it was four or five but somewhere in that general vicinity um and you can get on build in that way and i did manage to max out i think i only maxed out one but then i had most of the other ones somewhat maxed out as well so i found found a lot of pills in the apocalypse <laughs> got a lot of pill pushers out there um so those are the most of the things that you'll be looking around for as you're playing the game as you're trying to avoid um the infected uh or live people <laughs> Ooh, the infected the how infected. creepy are they the infected are still creepy can can confirm um the clickers always, it's just like, they're just sounds that they made. What Their sound design on the clickers is so good, but in such a terrible way. Like, they're just, they, it just gets under your skin in a way that you're like, I'm profoundly uncomfortable. And I also, I even, I had to wear headphones for part of playing this game because my neighbors at the time, I also moved halfway while playing this game. Uh, but my neighbors were so loud that I just couldn't enjoy myself while playing it. So I had to put on my, my big 
oh. Astros um, to play. And even then, like, they'll have the sound design, but I also still felt like I couldn't quite tell which direction it was coming from all the time, which makes you even more unsettled. And you're like, listen mode. Where have I? Like, and you just, like, scan around. But there's um, there are some new infected types, um, and they uh, real gross mm. and also very irritating to deal with but (laughs) which i know Brittany will be excited about um but uh you know it's be careful what you wish for baby girl i know so i know you don't like scary things correct would you how does the scary slash gameplay slash etc etc balance like you're able to play and finish it obviously this is the best game naughty dog has ever produced in both in terms of editing and in terms of pacing and I'm in terms so glad of, to hear that. In terms of like, I'm trying to think of the proper way to describe it, but whatever, the emotional roller coaster that it takes you on is well planned. Uh, I laughed just as much as I screamed in this game, if not more. So like there is a lot there um, in terms of like, yes, it's yes, it has scary moments. And yes, I screamed. And yes, like there are some jump scares, but I never felt like, the game was like just trying to be an asshole about it, if that makes no, sense. No, it's good. Like, um, I was just like, ah. I'd just be like, fuck, God damn it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I feel like it's funny because like my neighbors must be like, like there's no, no noise coming from this apartment. And then just like, a, fuck, like <laughs> really loud, really loud expletives. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm trying to be careful again when I talk there, but I think that that's fine to say. <laughs> yeah. Pacing wise, it's very good. Yay. Um, and yeah, there was never really a moment where I felt like it was dragging on too long. Like I said, and I, I, um, I, as I've repeated throughout, I feel like the entirety of what's good games, like editing, editing, editing. And I feel <laughs> like they actually did that. And I was like, thank God. <laughs> like, like, yes, it's still a long game. Um, well, quote unquote long. Uh, I feel like it was like 25, 26 hours. Um, but if you are somebody who really, I hunt, I, I did search a lot. I will say. There was only a couple of times where I looked down an alley or whatever. I was like, mm, I actually don't feel like exploring. There was very few times where that happened. I think it happened twice. Um, did the exploration you did feel meaningful or were you just looking at art? Um, so it, it's a it's a mixed bag. So like sometimes you don't always strike gold when you go exploring. I think that's fine. Um, but sometimes you find some really, they'll, they'll scatter around what I think are interesting side bits of storytelling, like, um, Mm. that are really, I'm like, can I tell you like one example? Cause it's not main story whatsoever. Uh, fine. Minor, the most minor of spoiler alerts, like talking about like a a tiny sneeze in the wind. Um, you like, you can find a garage where like a bunch of people are, or there, there are a bunch of infected in it and you like find the notes and stuff to find out like, what happened there and yeah i love that kind of stuff um yeah why they were all trapped or whatever like if you if you search around you'll figure out why that was the way it was um or if you don't you'll either just skip that and completely and we'll never know that the, that they were even there um or you could potentially not find all of the notes in the vicinity and be a little bit like head scratcher as to why that happened in the first place um, so is that a kind of situation where you'd find one of those books that you were talking about um the books i found I, I feel like they were never so hidden that you wouldn't find them. Mm. Um, but you do need to look around a little bit for them, but they usually weren't like mega buried uh, in the back somewhere because otherwise you would only have like one skill tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'd be a little bit sad. Um, but I, yeah, I always really, I still really liked, I really liked exploring this game even up until the end. Um, I just was like, even when my all my stuff was full, I'd be like, but what can I find? What's over here? Let me open this drawer. What? I don't know. Just just in case. <laughs> just in case there's something cool. Um, they do have collectibles as well. So if you are a collectible hunter, you can find uh, find cool things. So Ellie collects um, cards, like superhero trading cards. Uh, and they've done a lot of really cute things with those superhero training, or not training cards, trading <laughs> cards. <laughs> uh and so like they've put you know some fun clever like uh easter eggs on those so those should be really fun for everybody to find nice how was the gameplay when you were in the world with other npcs so in the demos that we've seen so far from naughty dog they have made mention that there will be several missions where 
Ellie has another character along with her. Did yeah. it feel like they were contributing in combat scenarios? Were they clunky? Were they great? Obviously, they're there for storytelling reasons, but as far as like gameplay is concerned, did it feel like that was something that they achieved, or it, did it feel like it was just kind of there? I liked it whenever I had another NPC with me. Um, personally, just because I like having friends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, it's just more of like a comfort blanket situation. Yeah. Um, combat wise, they were never a hindrance, which was good. Um, sometimes they would do things and sometimes they wouldn't though. It was a, I was a little confused as to like when they were programmed to try and take someone down versus when they were just following me basically. Right. Um, but they never alert enemies. Uh, so, or at least on the difficulty I was playing, I don't know actually if on higher ones they would or not. I still can't imagine that they would cause that'd be really annoying. Um, so you're safe there. You don't really have to worry about them completely messing you up, but there were some times when I wished that maybe I could have like sort of been like in mass effect could have directed them. Okay. If there were two people, like two enemies near us, I wish sometimes the game will naturally be like, I'll take that one. You take that one. It'll do it. Um, but there were some times when it wouldn't auto do that. And I would be like, damn it. I wish I could just mm. be like, you take that one. I take this one. Let's go. Um, so uh, you can't necessarily direct them, but sometimes they will just take people down and help you. Uh, again, I tend to go more stealthy. So like anything would be more of a stealth takedown. Uh, but so I, I didn't test it going in guns blazing to see how they responded actually. Um, I probably I'll do that. that. Yeah. I was like, Brittany, Brittany can do that. I got you covered. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, so I think that probably covers most of my questions that are generalist. And Brittany, I wanted to pose to you an option. If you want to opt out of the second part of the conversation, because you want to go in as blind as possible, that's fine by me. I'm happy to have the convo with Steimer and everybody who's listening and watching watching. Watching, watching. Watch no, I'm good. I'm <laughs> okay. good. I'm good. And plus, I already know some of the spoilers anyway at this point. <laughs> well, again, no spoilers. But this yeah. is probably where we're going to delve into more story-based discussion and how those themes come together and how it ties all of the g gameplay mechanics. So, if you are like several thousand million people out there who want to know nothing, yeah, about what is to come story-wise, just now, know that the game functions great, looks great. It's not broken. It's not. It's definitely far from broken. Far All right. So yeah. Okay. Now's the time to nope out. Check the timestamps. Skip ahead. Yeah. We'll see you in a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, moving on to more interesting conversations. <laughs> yes. So clearly, we all know that Naughty Dog is a masterful storytelling studio. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they have accomplished what they set out to do by making this their most ambitious title ever? This is leap, leaps and bounds the best thing that they've ever made. I am oh. happy to say that. Like, uh, I was, was a very big fan of the original The Last of Us. I was one of those people who didn't want another one. I'm one of those people who can freely admit that they were fucking stupid and really wrong. <laughs> um, I've also been somebody that has said, as this game has been shown through PR, and even when Neil has talked about it, that I wasn't sure if I wanted to play it um, because of more of just how heavy uh, it feels like it, it appears to be and, and how hard it might be to push through that. But as I mentioned briefly, like, yes, there is darkness in this game, but they have also balanced it with light. And I think that that is the part that they have not really talked about or shown a lot of in their PR campaign. To me, that's a little bit of a head scratcher um, because not everyone really wants <laughs> wants to sit and just be feel like they're dragged down by something. And I think you need you need the balance. You need both because um, you can't have a game that's all entirely light. I mean, you can, but it's not as interesting. Um, but this game strikes such a great balance of giving you those moments of levity and then just fucking like hammering you with something and then bringing you back up. Like it just plays the game perfectly. Um, and that is something that I think is He's trying to capture a Brit face. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I mean, that's just so, so hard to do, right? It's so hard to pace things properly like that and to make sure that 
your quiet moments aren't so quiet that you're bored or that your heavy moments aren't so intense you have a heart attack. So it's just the fact that they managed to do that and do it very expertly, like was, was really special for me. And again, because I was able to kind of go through this game on my own, right? Like no one else was playing it. There wasn't really anyone to discuss with. So that's why I have this notebook here. I'm sure you were probably like, what the, what the fuck is that? Um, <laughs> this was, so I would journal almost every session after I would play because I just would have so many feelings and emotions about everything that was going on. And uh, some of that was like fun emotion and some of that was, was harder emotion. Um, and I just like would write down my thoughts and probably went way down like too deep of a rabbit hole trying to be smart, but it was just like, <laughs> like, this is what I'm feeling. And, oh, what if this is connected over here? And, and, oh, look at the way that they're doing this. I think, um, the one general statement that I wrote that I could say thematically, I feel like this game is, uh, the last of us part two is a magnifying glass on just the duality of human nature. Like that's thesis statement, whatever, like that's what it is. Um, because it really does shine on both aspects of you as a person and like how you can be a hypocrite or you can have hypocritical actions and not necessarily be aware of it. Um, just really focuses in on the humanity of, well, of the characters in this game. Cause obviously those are the, those are the stars, but um, I just found it really interesting. And it's just, it's really, it's a hard game to talk about because of the way that they, they do it. It would be spoilery and I would never want to do that for anybody. So that's kind of like the best bo boiling it down sort of a situation that I can get to without saying anything. Uh, but you really, it makes you reflect or at least it made me reflect. It made me think a lot about, uh, you know, humanity and the way that we are and, especially in the times that we're in right now, especially with like the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that's happening in the world, this game feels more appropriate than ever. It feels like this was absolutely the time for it. Um, and that I think surprised me. I was just like, holy shit. <laughs> well, that's something that we talked about, right? We, a couple of weeks ago when we, you know, heard about the delay and then they gave the release date. One of the things that I expressed concern about that we discussed was, is it the right time in the midst of a pandemic that is about a virus that is claiming people's lives and really turning over society as we know it? Is it time to tell that story? And so you're saying the way that it's told, yes, it is. Yeah. I mean, here's like a little bit also more of what I had written. And I think that it kind of is a good jumping off point based on what you just said talking about like is it the right time with the infected or whatever and i'm like the last of us is not a tale of zombies it's not a tale of an infected um the last of us is not even a tale about the end of the world like what even though and like what that might look like the last of us as i've already said like it's a magnifying glass on us as human beings that's what it is it's not about the infected it's not about the world becoming apocalyptic it is what we are fundamentally just like Ugh. when you strip like the the setting is the is the uh vehicle for like getting you there because i think when you are able to strip away the bullshit of like regular everyday life is when you really can see and really dissect what it means to be human and the natural tendencies that we will fall into regardless of what is going on in the world that is super deep. <laughs> <Ready space. laughs> I am so turned on right now. <laughs> Since this time we're fucking dropping that truth knowledge. No, that's really, I think that's the best feedback I've heard about this game. Um, it, that's something I've been concerned about. And we, like you guys were just talking about. Don't get me wrong. I'm very jealous that Simon got a review copy. But there was a part of me that was thinking, I don't even know if I could handle that game right now. Shit's hard. Yeah. So it, it's good hearing what you just said about how there is the light, there is the dark. And it sounds like right now this game can even be viewed as cathartic because there is a lesson to be taken away from it that directly applies to the fucked up world that we're in at the moment. So that's really, really, really good to hear. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. Did you walk uh, away feeling a renewed sense of hope in humanity or that we're all just deep, dark, terrible people? It. <laughs> I mean, I think I walked away from the game 
I mean, first of all, just wanting to like have a spoiler cast immediately being like <laughs> yeah. someone else, please play and finish this game. Cause I need to talk to somebody. <laughs> um, but I, I mean, I do think it, uh, I don't think you will leave this game. I, mean, I feel like this is going to feel spoiler if it's not, but no, I didn't necessarily stop playing the game. and was like, well, guess I'll go slip my wrists now. Like that's not how I left it. Um, but I, I am also one human being, so I don't know. I feel like people will interpret it differently. People will take away, like, all the game is asking you to do is listen. So if I feel like if you do that, and if you take the time and really hear what it's trying to say, um, maybe even journal like I did. <laughs> if you want to go you ever really, before? really crazy. Yeah, usually. With a game? I mean, not, with a game. not a game and not like this. Not like this, or rather, I should say, not like this with a game. Um, yeah, that's really I usually really cool. do journal sometimes if I'm just, like, feeling run down or if I'm feeling like a lot of something for and I'm not sure why like I'll just sit there and kind of write um but this is the only time actually that I can remember doing this where I felt like compelled to sit down and just write out my feelings and write out how I think I would feel in that situation or if I could try and empathize or you know like just all sorts of there's all sorts of scattered brain thoughts in here (laughs) um but yeah, so it's it's been really interesting, and I can't wait for the spoiler cast because then I'll actually be able to read more of this journal and tell you a little bit um, more about my thoughts. I am excited to talk more about this with you. I know it's a challenge to try to delve deep into a very intense hands-on conversation with a game that is so narrative focused without trying to get into spoiler territory and without people that have also played with you. And we absolutely will be doing a spoiler cast for this in the coming weeks. We want to give you guys enough time to play the game. Brittany and I still don't have copies just to be clear. Yeah. Uh, So we're probably going to be getting copies next week with everybody else that's getting copies. And we want to give you guys enough time to, play the game without having to worry about it. So I think we talked about early July potentially uh, for the spoiler cast. So don't worry. We're not going to rush. We're not going to rush into it, but um, well, thanks for all the thoughts. I'm definitely more excited to play now. I was worried that there wouldn't be enough levity, that it would be too heavy. And which is why I've been constantly retreating into animal crossing (laughs) because you know as i mentioned in my vlog on patreon this week like stuff is hard and you need to take breaks and this doesn't feel like the kind of break that i really want or need right now but i always love great storytelling and i've never been disappointed with storytelling from naughty dog even if it's fun and whimsical like some of the stuff they've done with the uncharted franchise has been i still think it's great storytelling yeah and i think i also didn't actually even touch on the acting <laughs> at all because oh. i feel like i think I we just, just assume we that just it's, assume yeah. it's amazing <laughs> and like the assumption's correct like it's all <laughs> like, the the principal actors even the you know the the ancillary actors are all fantastic and um the way it was written and the way they deliver it both marry together perfectly and you're just like Sometimes I just sat back and I was like, God damn it. Like, they're just so good. Like, it's just like, it's the, yeah. The delivery yeah. of certain lines. I actually would sit and think about just like, oh, that's interesting. Like the way that they did. I, I was way too analytical for my own good, but I would think, sit back and think and be like, as the actor, like, oh, the way you're like even stuttering over a line or two on purpose to like get it and make it feel more real. Cause obviously we as human beings do not speak eloquently all of the time as I have demonstrated throughout this entire whatever how long it's been 40 minutes I thought you did great Steimer thanks um we were contemplating talking about some of the other stuff that we've been playing but I feel like the last of us part two kind of stands on its own just so you guys are aware we will touch on some of those other games next week I have been playing disintegration that copy was provided by private division Brittany, you've been playing something as well, right? Disintegration. Oh, oh, oh good. It. We can talk about our thoughts. But there's no invert option, so I stopped oh, playing. No. Oh, there is, though. In the tutorial, they talk about how you can invert your controls. Yeah, it doesn't work. Oh. So, okay, just clarify. To clarify, I have been in touch with PR. In the hub, when you can actually walk around, um, the invert doesn't work. And that's not a huge deal. I can get past that. I just wasn't sure if it applied to the rest of the game. 
because I got in there and I would flip on the invert controls when it's in third person and it wouldn't do anything. I started getting very dizzy. Interesting. So like, That's why, oh, why would they do that? Yeah, it sound, they're aware. So they okay. might be implementing a patch to update it, but it sounds like as of right now, the inverted options are only when you're on the graph cycle is my understanding. Ugh. Well, oops. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah. yeah, I have a lot of thoughts. I'm liking parts of the game and I'm not liking parts of the game. And we haven't touched the multiplayer yet because Brittany and I are playing on PlayStation and the PlayStation pool pre pre-releases is very small to say the least. Uh, PR set up specific PC multiplayer sessions. So if you've seen other people talk about multiplayer in progress reviews, that's probably where they've been playing. So we'll talk about disintegration next week, but for now, we're going to wrap up this segment, and when we come back, we've got our Patreon produced segment, and it should be another fun discussion. And stick with us. We'll see you in a minute. What's good, everybody? Welcome back. It's the final segment of the What's Good Games podcast. This is our Patreon produced segment at patreon.com slash what's good games. One of the perks is that you guys get to vote on what we talk about once a month. So this is actually for May's Patreon produced segment. We've been having to delay it due to various reasons. So thank you for your patience. But we will get to that topic in just a moment. But before we do that, we want to say thank you to our elite patrons and above. You may have noticed if you're on Patreon that we did a little shuffling with some tier names and tier colors to help accommodate for Discord rewards. So the former mythic category is now the elite category and the category above that is mythic. It's a whole thing. You can go to Patreon and see the details, but we want to give some shout outs to some of our friends who are supporting everything we're doing here at What's Good Games. Brittany, why don't you kick us off? Ah, uh, mm, Chewie's godson. Adrian Arak Williams. This is too far away. Al Tribesman. Alberto Andreas Videla. Alex Rogopoulos. Alexandre David. Alex Kohler. Andrew Cotton. Ariana Pieta. Bing Zubel. Bill Stilwell. Brian Harper. Brian R. Johnson. Spelt Wrong Brit, otherwise known as Brittany Heath. Captain Redbeard 86. Carl Peterson. Carla Callahan. Chris Wilson. Christer Lindmark. Shai Jackson Burgess. Cody Becker. Daniel Hall. David Olif. Devin Nitz. DK2112. <laughs> Donato Sanicio the third. Dustin Toby. E. Benjamin Checkness. Elizabeth Brooke. El Moshel. Emily Kent. Eric Z. Irma Gerd Arenda. <laughs> there is the jack. Gary Peck. Gio Corsi. I bought a hump a lot. Oh my God, I love you so much. That is an Austin Powers reference. I bought a, I bought a hump yes. a lot. Oh, that's great. I'm so happy I got that. Jake Sue. Jared Howard. <laughs> Jasmine Lee Sands. Jason Demich. J. Jeff Phillips. Jessica Bloom. Joe Kennison. Joe Schleif. Joe Wilson. John Drake. Joselle Bassa. Justin Foshi. Justin Foss. Ken Bulbe. Kenneth Stimmel. Kia uh, B. Marco Ontiveros. Marcus Ian Brown. Martha Emery. Matthew Goodair. Matthew Simpson. Maz. Melanthius Owens. Michael S. Michaela Sage. Mikey Phillips. Mohammed Mohammed. Molly Bittner. Nam Bui. Nathan Watkins. Nicole Humphrey. Noel Navarez. Oni Omereji. <laughs> Ozzy <Sorry>. Mejia. <laughs> Paige Porter. Patrick Higgins. Patrick Landry. Patrick Weller. Pete Shoemaker. Philip Dreher. Pino. Punctified. Pure Blue Octopus. R.J. Bryan. <laughs> Regan Ibsen. Renat Burns. Rob Leonard. Robert Adams. Roland Bala. Sean I. Sean Smith. Sean Stevenson. Stephanie Dupont. Stephanie Fitzwilliam. Tara Bruno. Teresa Enert. Oh, the mom. male escort. <laughs> but uh, male like the post office. The Supreme Commander of the Cyber Chihuahua Ninja Army. Throw seven. <laughs> Tom Buck. Tony Shea. Trent Berry. Trent Pennington. Trevor Starkey. Tyler McCall. Tyler Phillips. Will Cullum. Will Hernandez. Yes, on Keg, you know my. And Zach Hershey. Kiss. Kiss. Uh, thank you so much to all of our league patrons and above. We love that you guys support everything we do. And now, without further ado, Brittany, what is the Patreon topic? 
The topic is submitted by Noor Hamad, and the topic is... <clears throat> Hello, bits of a weird question. Are there any games or IP you would like to see made by another developer? I'll start. The Order 1886 by Naughty Dog, Assassin's Creed Odyssey by Bioware, or even Telltale's Game of Thrones by Bethesda. Sorry, Noor, I'm so sorry. <laughs> So, obviously, we have thoughts and opinions, but I thought it would be fun to incorporate Patreon a little bit more. So, I pulled the question to our patrons, and we got quite a bit of submissions, ladies. Yeah, I do actually think um, the first one in uh, Noor's suggestion was, was a pretty interesting idea, the Order 1886, mm-hmm. but by Naughty Dog. Because I also really, I thought the Order was a really interesting world and premise, um, but I... Also, okay, I can't lie. I don't think I, I played more than like an hour or two of that game. Oh, I Same. played the whole thing. I loved it. Yeah. I thought it was, I thought it was one of those games that got uh, unfair criticism. I think that there was an expectation that was mismanaged, mm-hmm. but I think the way that they made that game artistic and what they tried to do and how ambitious it was from Ready at Dawn was phenomenal. I would love to see more. Were there problems with the game? Of course there were. I just thought it was, I thought I liked it a lot more than a lot of other people did. I didn't think it got a fair shake. Fair enough. Mm. Yeah, I didn't think it was ever ever like a considered a bad game either. I always felt like it was either a game that was considered good or like had more potential but didn't quite hit the mark that's how i have always seen it yeah um but yeah and i thought it would be interesting if gorilla had a take on zelda because i think about the world of horizon zero dawn and granted like breath of the wild has such a big vast spanning world as well but a lot of it's empty a lot of it felt kind of like i mean to me i love like the little puzzles on the side but comparing that to Horizon's world. Like, that would be really cool. And the storytelling they did, I love Nintendo, and I think they're very talented, but I think Zelda needs a little bit of a... Personally, it needs a little overhaul. I know Breath of the Wild is a huge overhaul in itself, but it needs, like, a little bit more on the story heavy. Like, lean a little into the story, lean a little bit into trimming the fat, make that that map half the size. Just don't feel it was many trees as Gorilla tends to do, but yeah, I, I I think about the combat that the Gorilla developed for Horizon and how phenomenal it was, and how really sad Zelda's combat always is because that's not the focus of Zelda. Obviously, you know you want an RPG to be able to kind of like shoot the gap between marrying those story and progressive elements with combat, but. I didn't particularly care for any of the combat in Breath of the Wild. Didn't mean I didn't enjoy that game. Obviously, the game was great for a variety of other reasons. But yeah, I'm with you, Britt. I would be down to see a mashup from from Gorilla and Nintendo in a Breath of the Wild style game. This idea of Assassin's Creed Odyssey by Bioware with better romances is interesting because I think that to me is something that feels like it's Ubisoft was close to where Bioware was going or where Bioware has been with their, you know, inter-character relationships. But they didn't really make any of, Ubisoft didn't make any of the side characters in Assassin's Creed Odyssey feel like they had meaning or weight. Obviously, there was the whole fiasco with the DLC character. But in the main game, there was a couple people here and there that, you know, you interacted with that felt like they were there with you throughout the duration of the game. But nothing compared to the way your crewmates felt in in Mass Effect specifically. So, um, yeah, I would be down to see them go more RPG, but that comes at the expense of other items in the game, and I don't know how I feel about that as a diehard Assassin's Creed fan. I think they can uh, get rid of some of the fucking collectible bullshit in the world to make that happen. (laughs) That's fine. Not that those are equal weight items, but... Yeah, I mean, that was going to be my second point, but I'm, I'm with you that they can definitely scale back some of the open world like time fillers for lack yeah. of a better phrase to focus on more meaningful story elements. I would like to see that as well, but who knows if that's going to happen. Mm. I would say probably not, but these are all really great suggestions, Nor And Brittany, you pulled some suggestions from our community. I did. We have one here from Martha Emery, which I'm excited to hear your thoughts on. I think Destiny by Obsidian would be cool. That might mean an engaging story and a cool party of characters to relate to and have dialogue options and relationships with. Plus, it would still have really great combat and customization. And then down here, Agent 47 said they'd like to see a few games, but the one that stuck out was Dragon Age, also by Obsidian. Huh. I think if the Destiny thing was done 
jointly between Bungie and Obsidian, that might be better. Um, Cause I don't know that the, I mean, that I would describe Obsidian gun combat is great. Right. No, I will firmly say yeah. Obsidian has nothing on Bungie when it comes to gunplay combat and dare I say customization. I've been obviously playing a lot of Destiny 2 since the reveal stream and since the end of last season. Was up late last night running some stuff after I was playing Disintegration. And there is just no substitution for Bungie's combat. It is one of the best in the business. And the customization that they have in Destiny and how meaningful some of the gear and weapons are just to me is so well done. And the way that they've made those systems really work together is is better than it's ever been. And while I loved my time in the Outer Worlds, and obviously, you know, people think RPG for Obsidian, there's a bunch of other games that they're known for. I just don't look at it as something that was always stand out for me when I think about what Obsidian is kind of known for. They're known, I think, more for storytelling as well. Yeah. So if you just like contracted out the writing part to them, that might be fine. <laughs> Yeah, and then when it comes to Dragon Age and Obsidian from Agent 47, I'm not ready to pass along Dragon Age. I think Dragon Age Inquisition was a very, very, very good game. Granted, it was game of the year. (laughs) Yeah, we learned about some crunch issues that were at Bioware at the time, but I'm not ready to pass along Dragon Age yet. I think I think Bioware can keep Dragon Age at this point. So, yeah, keep it. All right, what else we got? We have. Oh, this is interesting. Seeing the Legend of Zelda handled by Ubisoft or CD Projekt Red. From J- Javin Mather. Mm. Hmm. Mm. I don't. I think CDPR is is not a good fit for Zelda. I think that Zelda's charm is something that is uniquely Nintendo, and it works because Nintendo likes to make their games universal, and CDPR does not. CDPR has a point of view, and they have a very strong point of view, which I think also makes their games successful. But it's just a very different philosophy and style of game making to what nintendo does and i think it would be a hot nightmare mess i think it would be weird but i think ubisoft if i actually be interested more in some of the way they've done explorations with really small indie studios or smaller games like so like the um the child of light and like those kinds of things having an a spin on zelda so not necessarily like a traditional zelda game but Mm -hmm. something with that ip i think could be interesting um but that's yeah, and I think CDPR I with Zelda, CDPR, I feel like there's just not enough to work with the Zelda in terms of story and characters. CDPR couldn't maximize their potential with that franchise. And that's, you know, part of the complaints I have with Zelda is they need to, like, get a little deeper with that lore. You know, give us yeah. some actual interesting characters and story, please. And then maybe, maybe we can talk about it. Give us a little something, some. Little some some Luke Lore. I would love to see Ninja Theory work with the Gears of War franchise. It would also be neat to see what the Coalition could do with an open world adventure game. I think that I'm down to see what more the Coalition could do. I think that we don't really know what the identity of that studio is because they were specifically formed to work on Gears of War. And it wasn't like they started as a studio that Microsoft then acquired and they got to work on Gears of War and they had a legacy before. It's interesting to see what they could do with their experience working on a third-person shooter in the style of Gears of War, doing something more open world. I would even be down to see a more open world Gears from the Coalition to see more from that story. Well, I don't want to have to be on a little sand yeah. thing. What was that thing that yeah, you had to the, navigate? The skiffer or whatever it was called. Oh, I don't yes, remember yeah. The, yeah, the sand skiff. Yeah, it was like, no more of that. oh, God, that was obnoxious. Um, but yeah, no, I do think that they have a lot of talent at that studio. But as you said, it was, it was like designed for a very specific purpose. So it could be fun to sort of do, honestly, even what like Gorilla did. Like Gorilla was like, we do this. Yeah. And mm-hmm. they did that for a really long time. And they were like, you know what? Let's just make something else. So, like, it might be cool to be like, all right, Coalition, pull a gorilla. Just, like, sit and fantasize about what you might, what type of game you might want to make. It doesn't need to be the thing that you've always made. And go do it and, like, enjoy because Unreal Engine 5 looks like it can do some gnarly shit. Gnarly shit. Yeah, and this, absolutely. This might be a good one to end on. It's pretty interesting. This comes from Devin Nitz. Would love to see an Until Dawn or a strictly narrative choice driven game like the type Supermassive Games develops, but done by Naughty Dog. Naughty Dog's games are always larger experiences, so someday I'd love to see them do a smaller two-ish hour game that's strictly narrative focused with little to no combat done by player action. 
Yes, I'm here for that. Their mocap is best in class. Their animation is great. They work with fantastic voice actors. They have awesome storytelling. They are teed up to do an Until Dawn-like narrative game with success. I am with you, Devin. I think that's a great idea. I would love to see that from them. I'm sure they've got people on their team that would be down for that too. Give those, you know, engineers and combat folks a break for a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I love that idea, though. I think that that's great. Yeah. Um, it's interesting looking at developers because you were we were talking about Gorilla and how they transitioned from doing Killzone into Horizon Zero Dawn. And I think about Insomniac as well and how they had such a interesting history as a developer, you know, starting with Ratchet and Clank and then moving into a variety of other titles, both VR and non-VR, and then obviously the smash success that was Spider-Man and having resistance under their plate as well. It's like, what would be a cool mashup that Insomnia could do with another developer, especially now that they're underneath the Sony Interactive Entertainment label to go like, what mm -hmm. could we, how does Insomnia pair up with somebody else to make something super cool. They work with Sony Santa Monica and they create a game called God Man. Oh, and it features Kratos in current day cities where he has to learn how to be the superhero nobody deserves but they need. Wait, what? <laughs> She's essentially pitching a Spider-Man knockoff for God of War. I mean, yeah. I would be down to see Kratos flinging some webs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. I mean, I think in general though, like, more than you might think other studios do inspire each other already. Like there is a lot of, especially if they're in the same vicinity. So like an insomniac can easily talk to a naughty dog or can easily talk to a Sony Santa Monica. Um, and I do think that they, they do tend to like share knowledge and share ideas back and forth a little more than you might realize. Um, not to say it wouldn't be, I, I think a full on collaboration would, would feel much differently, but, uh, and still could be pretty cool. Because Insomniac, ugh, I'm so sad that we'll never see another Sunset Overdrive, but that's fine. I know. That game. The game was fun. It like, was, it was really, just kind of stupid yeah. fun. Like, it yeah. wasn't never going to set the world on fire. So I understand, like, leaving that IP to die is fine. But, uh, you know, it was fun. Yeah, the story elements and the overall, like, lore of that game was definitely very weird. You don't like the soda that... T turns everyone into <laughs> i have the promotional <laughs> one that was sent to me from insomniac on the sh bookshelf in the back of the studio over there the that orange fizzy stuff it's all propaganda don't drink soda <laughs> <laughs> i know it's bad for you i mean they're not wrong but um but this is it's, it's kind of a fun exercise to think about you know what could be it's interesting because you know on here agent 47 also lists silent hill but by capcom and i think that that's definitely a mistake um, I think that I would much rather have Kojima Productions take the Silent Hill that we thought we were getting and actually continue with it. But it's interesting to look at games that were originally made by one developer that are now being made by another developer because there's several IPs that have done that over the, over time. And have they been successful? Question mark. Some yes, some mm. no. Yeah. I'm just mark. thinking kind of meta right now. Because this is going to be the last segment of the podcast. Mm -hmm. So we don't know right now if Horizon Zero Dawn 2 has a sequel or if Capcom has announced Resident Evil 8. Because I'm wondering, depending on what this announcement looks like for Capcom, should Capcom do the next Resident Evil? You know what I mean? In Wait, terms what? of like a new story <laughs> and taking the, taking the series in a different direction. Because again, all rumors, all rumors here. But it sounds like it'd be going in a really weird, really weird place. And... I think the concern right now is can Capcom hold on to the momentum of Resident Evil and can they continue to do right by it? Granted, remastering the game is one thing. We saw how successful Resident Evil 2 was. Resident Evil 3 with the remake was kind of like a eh. And Resident Evil 7 was a good step in the right direction, but everyone's kind of concerned that they're going to overdo it. They're like over overcorrecting. Exerting. Yeah, or overcorrecting, whatever. Yeah. And so we're going to see. So I'm just thinking a little meta. My head's like in the future right now. Mm. Well, I'm glad that you brought that up because we are going to end the show um, because we have to start streaming. And thank you for your patience, everybody. I know it was a little confusing because we shot it out of order this week, but we wanted to get as much info in for you guys as possible. 
Thank you to everybody who wrote in and gave us some suggestions for this topic. Certainly lots to think about, and we could absolutely continue it on our Patreon Q&A, which we were going to be announcing the date and time for in the next couple of days. So stay tuned for that. And thank you to everybody who supports us and participates in our community and helps support everything we do here at the show. For now, we're going to leave you and hope that you had an exciting week filled with lots of PlayStation announcements and that you've got a nice weekend planned ahead. And don't forget, my message from Patreon stays the same. Take a break. It's important for everybody. Bye, everybody.